we go. Ew. Uh, another, I bought a farm coming right at you. Getting into rhythm here, you know, feeling that time of year. We, it's so funny. We're, uh, it's June 29th. I mean, it's basically July at this point. If you're listening to this, it's, it's basically July. July. It's July. Um, <laughs> I was looking at my calendar when we were like, how do we get back out? We were like making plans to go back out to the Midwest. I was like, what is Independence Day? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, Independence yeah. Day? Fourth of July. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, you know, there's a, there's a point in the year and it's cool. Like I, I love, I love late season and like, you know, that postseason scouting and shed time, you know, um, the food plot stuff, especially like that spring, summer food plot stuff, man, it all, it, you're just, you're, you're at the mercy of nature. Like if you don't get it in, like we talked about our beans, like we hit our beans, right. But there were 15 or 20 days there where it was like, man, are we even going to get these in? And we were just out in the Midwest in Illinois, and I mean, it was bone dry in some boy, of those places. She's fertile, but she ain't moist. She, she can put moist. the seed in, but she ain't gonna grow. She ain't gonna grow. That's it. That was that was the uh, <laughs> the motto of the trip. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just you're just in this like blocks of time, blocks of time. I feel like when you turn that corner into July, and obviously we've got fall food plots and stuff coming up, but I mean, you can see it. Like the the season is in in view. You're, you know, it's the home stretch to like getting things done, starting to see some of these bucks are really starting to take form here in the last week or two. Mm -hmm. Um, She'll sneak up on you too, man. It's like, there's some, some work you should be doing now that will set you up to, for like, you know, uh, easier, successful plantings. Like I've got dad out there brush hogging right now and cause stuff I plan on spraying here in the next couple of weeks. And it's really a progression. If you let it get away from you, it, it will. Yeah. I think, um, I think we're right at that point where, you know, you, you almost have to have a little bit of a strategy here, a little bit of a plan of like, Hey, oh, you when, gotta have a strategy. When you better be, when you are you getting be these in? When are you spraying? Checking stands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got, yeah, you should honestly be wrapping up trimming stands and stuff. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people wait till like August and stuff and I hate, I yeah, just, no disturbance at that point. I don't, I want to be out by then. So we've, we've trimmed a better part of our stands out. We had, uh, Dale and Brian come out mm-hmm. last weekend and, uh, checking on the bean. So, like in the immediate future, we're getting ready to spray beans. Mm-hmm. They will have been in for like four weeks here. Yep. Most of the stands are trimmed. Mm-hmm. Most of the clover plots have been checked on. Dad actually cut one yesterday with more rain coming. Yep. Um, and we're shaping up for spraying brassicas and, and stuff. Spraying for fall mm-hmm. plots and all that. That's, yeah. That's where we're at. Wild to think that's that's how it's going. So, um, anyways, uh, we got a guest today uh, who I think is going to fit into this discussion really well. Um, so we've got Bobby Kendall from the Whitetail Group on. Um, if you're not familiar with Bobby or the Whitetail Group, we'll let him do a lot of the talking on this. But um, those guys are, are are based in the Midwest. Um, I think uh, Illinois, Iowa, and, and most recently they've got some ground here in Kansas. Um, but, you know, really looking at that aspect of, of land from an investment angle, um, as well as, you know, uh, I guess manipulating those properties to become prime deer hunting, uh, properties for people. And so I think it'll be really cool for our listeners in the about a farm series that, you know, are striving to, you know, find that piece of land. Right. And, and you and I are guilty of it in that, you know, we'll look at a piece of land and there's a list that we have in our head. Like these are the boxes that I'm looking for it to check. Very rarely do you ever find a property that checks all the boxes. Um, you know, I would say almost anybody who owns lands ha- had to sacrifice something. Maybe it wasn't the exact area they want, or maybe, you know, the timber wasn't as good as they thought, or maybe there wasn't as much open ground as they wish they had. Um, but there's always some sort of sacrifice on, on these things. So, you know, I think hearing from Bobby, who's been in this stuff for a long time, uh, and really, you know, wrapping his head around, you know, what he's looking for in a piece of ground, not only from an investment side, but from a, a deer hunting potential side, um, is probably what most people are thinking about. You know, those two, for a lot of us, go hand in hand. We want it as an investment. We also want it to be able to kill big bucks. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, trying to really wrap your mind around it. And, and I say that because... I think most people, um, again, us being guilty of it, become more conservative or hesitant on when to pull the trigger. You know, maybe you look at a property, a property comes up and you're you're like, "Eh, I'm not sure, it's gone. Um, And it's like, you know, at some point you gotta get in the game, right? You gotta, you gotta, you know, go for it. And that doesn't mean just buy anything. You're talking to me right now? Talking to you right now. 
but you know, you, you've got to kind of jump in with both feet and say, okay, here's what I got. You know, this is what I'm, I'm working with. Well, to the, like to the sacrifice or, you know, checking all the boxes, uh, you know, point that you made there. I, I think it's important to try to align that with what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if it's financially, you're able to take this on, you have a lot of time to be able to do something like this. Maybe you have connections in a certain space that like the property you're looking at is lacking, whether it be timber or farm connections, right? Boom, 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 run down the list, food. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you look at a piece that other people are like, eh, this is, you know, too, too big of a, a hurdle for me, or it's, it's this or it's that. It's like, I can do this. Yeah, I can, mm -hmm. I can fix that part of it and I can really turn this into something. Mm -hmm. And so th the price needs to be reflective of like, uh, certainly the boxes that it does check, but also, you know, you may have an opportunity with what you bring to the table. So yep. I think that's, that's kind of cool to look at it and see how a property fits what you want. Yeah. And I think that's the big thing is like, we, we get asked a lot about, Hey, what do we think about this property? Or like, you know, if, they, if we were buying in this area, what we're looking for, what we are looking for is probably a lot different than what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, and it's it's based on time and experience in hunting and bucks that we've killed in the past. Case in point, you know, we, we went out and walked one, uh, n not one of Bo Bobby's, we did walk one of Bobby's the other mm -hmm. day, but we yeah, walked we'll a couple others. And, and, you know, you and I just have like a bad taste about that Southern Illinois. No offense to anybody that's down like there. Just deep, deep Southern Illinois. Deep yeah. Southern Illinois. And it's like cl close to where we were at. It's like, you know, it, it doesn't take long to start getting into that. That real blocky timber feel, the real, you know, bottom forest Wet, floor. Like, you know, that it floods out often. And so you and I looked at that and we're like, no, not, not, <laughs> not what we want. And then in the meantime, the realtor's calling us and he's like, hey, offer's coming offer's in tonight. Offer's coming in like, tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Let him have Let it. Let him have it. Let him have it. Yeah. yeah the guy I mean, obviously saw a lot of potential in it. Well, and it's, so. I mean, we saw a ton of deer and there was a ton of deer sign on it. It's just, um, we've hunted that stuff and, and our, our goals and experiences. And we never and, went it again. So yeah. We like, just, <laughs> we just didn't want to be down there, you know? And so, yeah, I yeah. mean, I'm sure the guy who buys that piece of property is going to be, you know, super happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just didn't fit what we were looking for. Just didn't, didn't help that, that we saw a kid on a four wheeler driving in there. <laughs> As we're passing it. Good chance. I just the stop guy him buying. like, hey, were you just coming out of this property? He's like, uh, yeah. Yeah, good chance the guy buying it didn't know that either. So um, I, I love this. Uh, this uh, this is uh, Bobby's like ab about us. So there's a list here of the, the deer that he's killed, uh -huh. which I think is pretty cool. I personally harvested a 211, a 201, a 189, a 184, a 183, a 176, a 173. I'm sure Bobby's a 170, smirking right a 169, now. A 169, a 167, a 168, a 165. A 163, a 162, a 160, and several other bucks uh, since his first 147. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Not all over the Booner mark, but all over 60s. All over 60s. I, I can't see so, Bobby, but I have so there, smiling there's about that a uh, there's a uh, repertoire for you. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's if I'm going a to resume is if I'm going to talk to a guy about buying the right land or what I'm looking for in the right land, I want a guy like that. Or, or in fact, the way that we met Bobby was through Ben rising, mm -hmm. a, a guy like Ben rising, who's notorious for killing big bucks, you know? So those are the kind of guys that, you know, I put my trust in because met, of met, what their personal success is. Yeah. Met personally, but we've seen Bobby beforehand with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the content they're putting out through the white toe group. So he's mm -hmm. doing a nice job with promoting the properties and, and their approach towards, uh, the listings that they're picking up and so yep. it'd be cool to talk to them. Let's bring them in. Hey, what's up guys? Not too much. Uh, so you made it back from Kansas, back in Illinois. I did, I did in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I hear the puppy in the background. So puppy oh, being puppy. Man, yeah. <laughs> yep. got two puppies in there. So oh, two man. puppies and two. So that's why I've been kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The mental escape to, to get out of there. Uh, well, listen, man, we appreciate you you joining us today and um you know for i guess for a lot of guys jared kind of ran down the, your little bio there obviously of, of what, what else the needs to be said yeah it's <laughs> like oh, there it is that's there's there's the proof in the pudding but for for people um who maybe haven't heard about you you know uh, tell us a little bit about yourself like where'd you grow up you know i know you're in illinois now but is that been always in illinois yep so i uh basically grew up in charlotte north carolina from like four to 16 okay uh, originally from upstate upstate new york oh wow and we went back to new york when i was 16 and i had started kind of hunting in north carolina um but went back to upstate new york lake george when i was like 16 um and then i ended up at 
far, I was playing music full time, like about when I was 17, I started playing. I grew up in a resort town, so I was playing music and, um, and, uh, I went to a pharmacy school, Albany college of pharmacy for a semester. I knew I, I knew I wasn't going to do that. Um, <laughs> So I was like, you know, I'm going to do the classic, take a semester off and go, go do something and figure out my life. So I decided I was going to go, I went on a hunt. I think I skipped class or something and went to Pike County, Illinois on a pretty crappy hunt with three of my friends and two of my friends on the way home. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take a semester off and I'm going to go out there and guide for somebody. And a few weeks later, I ended up meeting Toby Stay, who obviously is part of the Whitetail group. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up meeting his father in a gas station of all places in upstate New York. And we were just kind of making small talk. And he's like, Oh, well, my, my son is a, has an outfitter in, in, in uh, Brown County, Illinois. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I was like, I literally want to go out there and guide for somebody. So like two weeks later, I went out for an interview, which was basically like a shed on and uh, basically started getting into this rhythm where I was playing music the rest of the year. And I was guiding in the fall for him and uh and that went on for several years and then i kind of started like trading playing music for hunting rights to a bunch of outfitters so i was like a little hunting gypsy singer guy Uh uh-huh and then uh, and then kind of started leasing my own ground bought a little house in town i was reading books on real estate and you know like you know all these robert kiyosaki books and stuff trying to figure out what i was going to do and i bought a rental property in upstate new york which um uh, kind of did did something creative to, to get that and so that kind of that kind of got me in the game it's funny you said that in the beginning about getting in the game because I, I have a real estate mentor he's a big developer from Huntsville and as I was starting to do this stuff with land out here he'd say are you in the game yet and I'm like uh, and I kind of like talk in circles but I really wasn't and he's like you got to get in the game and that's like that was basically what he'd say you got to get in the game and so finally I just like dove into the game that's um, funny, man. Yeah, it's it's fast yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it went from buying the first farm to you know kind of what it is now, where there's a brand around it. That's crazy. I mean, it it is one of those things. Uh, obviously, huge step. You know, where, no matter where you're at in your your life or financial mindset to to you know jump into this land game, especially. But um, you know, there's also like a weird, and I, I guess you have to be um kind of ate up with it but there's a weird confidence in it too that's the best way that i can describe it is like if i see a piece of ground that you know i just in my gut i feel good about even though it's a big investment i also feel like oh not not like an overconfidence but a but an extreme confidence in like yeah i know this is a good move um and it's hard to describe that to somebody who hasn't done that move because they're they're still in the standpoint of like this is and jared's in that kind of position now like we've we've talked back and forth of where it's like this is a big amount of money that could go into a farm at the same time i'm already i've been in the game right i've had some investments pay off from land and so i'm looking at it as i'm like hey man this this is a good one it's it's kind of intimidating it's like you're like at a roller rink and you see everybody that's like investing or whether they're flipping or they're killing big box off of properties and it's like they're going so fast and you're like you're okay i'm gonna jump in <laughs> i'm gonna jump in right here you know and like and so in our scenario it's, it's helpful that like you know you've been around the ring and you're like dude yeah. let's we're gonna jump in right here yeah and so like we're we're actively pursuing property obviously is a, is a topic of conversation on our end but seems like that's the, the, like- the only way to start is jump in a lot like hunting, you're you're ninety percent of the time you're you're not ninety nine percent of the time you're not shooting. You're just looking, feeling, learning, yep. and then yeah. when the, something's right, you just. I mean, I used to crunch numbers like hardcore and stuff, but I've gotten to where it's just kind of a gut feeling, you yep. know. Yeah. Strategies change and stuff, but yeah. Well, and I think that um, you know, if we we hone into kind of where where you're at, Bobby, in Illinois, especially. You know, so how I guess when did you when did you buy your when did you start the 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 farm buy and you talk about that rental place in in New York and obviously you know if that's producing income that sets you off but when when did you dive into your first piece of land in in Illinois? Right, um, you know it was probably sometime around 2013 or 14 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, 13. I, I remember I was driving home for some reason I think when I drive I, I just that's when you think you know yes. a lot of my ideas come from driving or flying and um 
I was like, well, what? Because I had already was dabbling in the rental property and bought a house up there to kind of flip. And I was like, well, what if I did it with farms like and set them up? Because at that point, nobody was doing that. There's been this like paradigm shift sure. in the hunting world from from out going on outfitted hunts to leasing to buying. And like, you know, and it's it's been interesting to kind of watch that like through the masses, like how it's kind of shifted. But I was like, well, what if I just bought one and set it up and, you know, sold it? So I, the first one I bought was 20, 20 acres. I think I had like maybe $10,000 saved up as, you know, I scared the crap out of me, but I just dove in and did it and, uh, and got some pictures of some big deer and, and fumbled my way through it. And I, and I sold it. And, um, and that was that was the first one that it was probably somewhere around 2013 or something like that and then that led to another one a little bigger one a little bigger one and are you um on those early ones were you 1031 in those properties or no just no um were you naive to that is that why you didn't do it or just you know the gains weren't super big um and you know i have mixed feelings about 1031 exchanges like you got to be careful with them because you know, there's a, there's a lot, a, a lot about that, but you got to be careful with them because, because of the time thing, I think it can force you into maybe not waiting for the right deal. It can force yeah. you into something. Um, and then, you know, you would have been better off just paying and being relaxed and waiting. And I know like my, my main mentor I was talking about, he, he always felt like that as well. And hmm. there's a lot of nuances with 1031 nowadays, you know, you, you have to keep a farm over a, over a year, technically, you know, there's, there's some gray area about intent and this and that in the, in the eyes of the IRS. But, um, you know, nowadays with interest so high, some of the strategies have changed because it costs so much money to hold a farm for that period that you have to weigh your, your, op, your opportunity costs, other things you could be doing with that. Right. Money that you're sitting around waiting to save you know 20 percent. so yeah um the tool um there's definitely times we we do a lot, a lot of 1031s and there's definitely times we we use that um but uh i didn't do a whole lot of them early on mm -hmm. yeah i mean because it seems i think the forced side of things is probably the the big one because of that time frame i know winky you know did a 1031 and he basically you know whether you want to say he got forced or not, he had to buy apartment complexes. He did he because the farm that he was looking for just didn't come available. That was a ten thirty one. Yeah, so oh. he had to dump it into the apartment complexes, you know, to to oh. basically <laughs> save face. Well, you why, know? why wouldn't you just uh, why don't you just find something first and then make your? I mean, obviously, it puts you at a, a little bit of a disadvantage. Make a contingent on a sale of your place, you know, and if it's a turnkey whitetail property, go ahead. You can do reverse ten thirty ones too. So. Which is but my favorite. About a, about a 1031 is all the buyers that it creates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of buyers out there and they're good buyers. Oh yeah. 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 They're sitting on cash. They're ready to spend. They need this. They have to spend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good one. It, what you were going to say, the, the reverse. It also depends on the strategy. You know, I, I have always been a lot faster moving because I'm young and I'm trying to build cash, but, as I'm getting older or older than when I started, I'm 37 now, um, I'm doing a lot of other, you know, different strategies and diversifying. I have longer term, like, you know, tillable portfolios that I'm building and different, some other different things going on. So, so it, with that, when you're slower moving, I mean, for like listeners, like if you want to get in the game, buy your first piece and move slower, like I do it for business. So sure. like I'm, I'm essentially a recreational developer. But if, if you just get in the game, buy something, hold it a year, year and a half and let natural appreciation and then and then, uh, you know, roll it to the next thing. I mean, there are so many people that I know and watch and deal with that have built, I mean, built wealth accidentally buying hunting ground and then selling it and mm -hmm. rolling it and 1031 it. And that's where 1031 really makes sense, where you're moving slower. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting process for people because there there's a lot of people listening to this that are like, listen, I just want to find like my piece, like the piece. It'll be the only piece I buy. That's that's what I have, you know. But then there's you know, and I probably was of that mindset at one point in time, you know, to where now, 
I have some pieces that I would say are more, you know, long-term or forever type pieces. I have other pieces where I'm like, you know, I want to make some money off of this thing and then I want to flip it back out. Um, you know, once that ball gets rolling, you know, the opportunities open up to continue to expand that, that operation essentially, you know, and it sounds like Bobby, that's kind of where, where you were. Like, I don't know necessarily if you started with the mindset of I'm going to, you know, be a recreational developer necessarily, but that's kind of what it's evolved into. (laughs) No, no, that kind of came a little bit later. So like I was buying farms, setting them up, selling it. I started documenting it a little bit, like with my own cameras and my own makeshift editing and probably made a, like a little website on Wix and whatever. (laughs) Um, But at a certain point, I'm like, well, you know, I need to basically build a brand around this. Mm -hmm. And because then if I build a brand around it and, and my farm is now different than the three other ones that somebody comes looks at, it's got the edge. And that just ensures me to sell my farm over the one down the road so that's so that's kind of why the whitetail group was born and way back then i kind of had this vision of like a group um and there's it's kind of a play on words so it's a group like of the buyers and the you know the just the community of people that want to you know be involved and feel part of the the whitetail group um it also is a play on words for like um the people behind the team so like i knew that it'd be way more powerful to be a group of people than just any one, like, Mm -hmm. you know, person's ideas, like just mine or just any one consultant. The the team is more powerful. And then when you start compounding, like, you know, like I have an in-house forester on the logging side now and like, and, you know, everybody brings something. So that group would be more powerful than, than anything. And I had a dream of bringing these bigger, some of these bigger names in, which somehow happened. (laughs) Um, and so, you know, it just, that's kind of how it was born. It was born and it's kind of, I use the analogy. It's like an Arnold Palmer golf course. Like, you know, it's, it's just his golf course. It's his interpretation. Like with hunting, there's no, there's no right or wrong. Every, everything works. Every strategy works. It's, it just doesn't work all the time. It's the only thing we can basically agree upon is it's all like everything can be broke down deer hunting into probability numbers and Mm -hmm. and odds. All you can do is stack odds um, with everything you do. Um, so, so yeah, I mean that's kind of kind of why the brand was built and and you know how it's evolved and and it's worked out perfectly, you know, because now we we built our own buyer buyer base, mm-hmm. pre market list, um, and uh, you know it's, it's just been pretty wild, surreal. I mean, like. I kind of, after I stopped guiding and stuff, I kind of like didn't do it on purpose, but kind of like, you know, I didn't watch any outdoor stuff. I, I'm not a big social media guy. I didn't, I just kind of like did my thing in Toby with Toby and, and we just had our heads down for years. And then all of a sudden, like kind of like surfaced and, you know, brought Lee involved and, and it was like, wow, like you didn't even realize kind of how, that we had kind of made like a little bit of a presence and stuff. So hmm. uh, I th- not that it's the main topic of conversation, but since you mentioned it, I-, I think it's interesting to see that transition of like the, the TV personalities, you know, Lee Lukoski obviously is one of them. The, the Drury's are another mm-hmm. one that fits into this. Uh, you could probably run down the list of people who at one time probably made a majority of their money from TV show sponsorships. Uh, and it happened at the same time that that kind of started to, to dry up, you know, mm-hmm. N- not that it's dead and gone completely, but, um, you know, the amount of the number of people that are making good, really good money yeah. from TV sponsorships today as compared to, you know, five, 10 years ago, it's certainly getting smaller and smaller. And you it's see the McDonald's story. They're in the real estate. They're business. in the real estate yeah, business. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think everybody like look around and they're like, well, as this is happening, the shift to digital, like it's, it's really insecure. It's unsure. At the same time, you know, you've got, I'll give Whitetail Properties some credit. Mm-hmm. There's, there's companies that are really doing well, profiting from rec- selling recreational real estate, mm-hmm. you know, and I think uh, that people took notice and are like, we need to, we need to be involved in this. We have a platform in this space already. We could really add value to that space you know, let's, let's get involved. And I think, you know, p- part of Lee being involved with yours is, is probably a, a manifestation of that to some degree. Yeah. 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 Well, he's awesome. He's just a, he's just a super down to earth deer hunter guy. All he wants to talk about is deer. I mean, he's yeah. there are some feedback, awesome people. That's what I was going to say. Kind of, um, you know, 
in a challenge to all those TV personalities or who were TV personalities is the ultimate thing is, is like, you got to be good at growing and killing big deer. Lee being one, Ben Rising being one, Drury's being one. Like, there are a lot of people who had- comes from a track record. A lot of people who had TV shows. A documented track record. Right, but they they bounced to outfitter to outfitter, whatever it might have been. Like, if you said, hey, you know, if I set you up with a piece of property, can you manage it and grow big bucks? There's a lot of them that can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they, they were- purely entertainers to a point yeah well you don't see michael waddell selling properties no right no. <laughs> what's really fascinating about it is like and i i've tried to kind of get this out there in video format and i'd like to do more of it um but all these guys that are successful or whatever like they all have a different stroke of the brush that's what i call it yeah like not not nobody no two guys has the same like signature yeah right and so watching and learning from Lee and his, you know, strategies and things he does. And I've got, I've got to learn a lot of stuff from him and then, you know, hanging out with Ben and, and he, he's a much more like a purist, just, um, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> not a lot of development, just knows what, but at the, at the core of all these guys that are successful, that they, they know what makes a big maturity or tick and they know what they, yep. they, they, they're ahead of them. I always talk about that, like being ahead of the buck in the season and not getting behind them. And they they know how they work, and therefore they're able to reverse engineer everything from that. That's the most important thing with you know development stuff is 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 you know understanding the way that they work. But everybody's different. You know, Mark Luster is involved. Yeah, I'd say my 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 kind of signature aligns most with Mark's. We're very similar. Um, but you got to appreciate everyone. You know, I remember the conversations, just people, oh, well, I hunt here and I could kill deer anywhere. And it's like, it's a bad attitude to have. It's like, you should always listen to everybody mm-hmm. because different strat. I mean, I grew up, you know, when I was like 14, 15, joined like a dog hunting lease in South Carolina, <laughs> just so I had access to bow hunt, you know, and, and I hunted with them with the dog sometimes. And I mean, I don't have any interest in doing that now. Do I respect them? Yeah. Cause it's, you know, yeah. it's a heritage or whatever. Do they know more about like a big bucks escape route than I probably do? Yeah, they do. So like everybody, the guys in the Adirondacks, I'm friends with a lot of them because I grew up up there. Like those guys have a skill set. It's yeah. all the same animal. It's just different tactics. So you really need to listen to everybody. You know, one of the things that we have going for us out here is we we're around mature deer more often than maybe guys back east so we spend more time with them back to the number saying probability we spend more time with them therefore we we get to learn a little bit more possibly about them so if you're in an area that every five or eight years you have a mature buck to hunt you got to do get as much knowledge as you can about that critter because when you do have him it's not the time to be learning it's the time to be you know using some of the things that you've learned so mm-hmm. I, i've got a very you know just kind of laid back you know i i'm just one of the signatures i just, i got my way i don't care mm-hmm. if you agree or disagree i'm a big i'm a huge moon guy i know everybody will say mm-hmm. like the science and blah 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 says it doesn't work and mark luster doesn't believe in the moon I, i'm here to tell you i can feel the difference on an evening in october leading up mm-hmm. to the full moon so does Lee Likoski. So does Ben Rising. So does Mark Dree. So do yeah. I listen? I, I don't really care what the science and stuff says because I can feel it. And, and I know other guys that can feel it. You know what I mean? So that's interesting. Be- I, you know, I think a lot of that too, you know, because obviously science says no on that stuff. But I think a lot of that too, in anything hunting, right, is if you go into a hunt confident, I 100% believe that you're more likely to kill a deer. Um, yeah. If you go in unsure about things, it, it immediately, I think, I, I honestly think deer, especially mature, I think they can sense that. Like if you just, you know, you're a little bit off or you're not, you're not just super sharp and confident about stuff. I think that whether it's you making a mistake and just not realizing it, I think those big bucks can tell that kind of thing. Yeah. What, yeah. Well, it's here- all odd stacking. And, you know, like the moon thing, I feel confident, like a lot of people, they only hunt a couple days out of October or whatever. And so like, I might, I might not see anything and I might think it's going to be a great night. And I don't chalk that up to like, Oh, I'm going to change all my thoughts on these philosophies. I just chalk it up to, you know, I'm only one guy. If we looked at a hundred guys that sat in that area, 
I, I feel like more, a higher percentage of them would have had good encounters or good sits, but just one guy, you can't, you can't mm-hmm. formulate what you've seen. Oh, well, I've seen this. I've seen that. It's got, I, I guess the reason I say I can feel it is because it, I'm in the woods every day all October, all November, all December for the past 15 years, you know, because I, so I can, you start to just, you know, and again, we're talking, what, what are we talking? Are we talking about a four-year-old deer? Are we talking, is the conversation about a six-year-old deer? Yeah. Different critters, you know? Yeah. Jeremy and I like to joke, uh, that the business model is like unbeatable. Cause it's like, we might sit here and say, well, prove to me that the moon is not doing anything. And, you know, Adam Hayes, who's selling it, could sit there and say, prove to me it's not, <laughs> you know, and he's got, there's an army of guys that are killing booners and 200 inches year after year after year that, that claim to believe in it. It's dude, it's, yeah, I think, we could, we, that's a, that's a whole, that's a different podcast. <laughs> but, uh, like, you know, Adam, and I don't even, I have no idea what a red moon is. I know he's big on that and the moon dial. So let's no clarify. Idea. What are you talking about as far as believing I'm in the moon? I'm just talking about the position of the moon. So when, like, I mean. Overhead when, or underfoot. When, when yeah on the full on the day of the full moon that's what, what the I red moon is yeah we had we had him on he explained it to us we didn't really understand it either the, the red moon all that is is when the moon is overhead or underfoot within a certain time frame of sunrise or sunset yeah i think it's like that's 30, what it is 30 30 minutes to an hour yeah so basically that's what i so on the i'm looking in october i'm trying to line up so in october i'm evening hunting so in october I, I'm looking for the full moon in the week leading up to it. I don't care if it's the fifth. To so the, the ninth phase of the, the moon you're talking about. Yes, but I guess it's the kind of the same thing he's talking about. The week leading up to the full moon is more powerful to see a big mature deer on his feet in daylight. The week after, it's more powerful in the morning. Therefore, in November, when morning hunting is a little more conducive or whatever, I'm looking for that after, you know, that week after. And I'm not really looking for it because I'm yeah. still hunting anyway. It's it just it's just odd stacking. So if that, hmm. in my opinion, if that f- week of the full moon is coming October 5th to the 9th, it's it's good, but it's not as powerful as if it's the 26th. Yeah, 26th. Well, well, that is different. So like the Adam Hayes moon guy has nothing to do with the phase. It's totally irrelevant. It's purely overhead around position. Foot. Yeah, position. But the, but it, that is the same thing because on the day of the full moon, the moon rises in the in the sun sets at exactly the same time. So the day before the full moon, the moon rises forty five minutes earlier. So you see it in the sky. So it is the position. Mm. And again, I'm a scientist. All I know is that when you have the trifecta, and I think this year is is like that. I have to check my app. When you have a year, and this is other hunting strategy stuff we could dive into, but I kind of approach uh, an approach of, you know, you got three things that affect deer movement, date or phase or mindset. Yeah. Essentially what it is. And then moon phase. Both of those things are constant. You can predict them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the third thing would be environmental. Yeah. You know, number for me being barometric pressure, but those three, three things. So when you have the three things line up, your odds or probability are just way higher. So like this year, October full moon is the 28th. So like, mm. I'm really, I'm already like, uh, I'm already looking at that 23rd, 23rd to the 28th, um, of October. So, and it's in the end of the month. So it lines up with date phase or mindset. Yeah. So then the third thing is the environmental. So mm-hmm. if we get a high pressure front in the end of October from the 23rd to the 28th, and you have a big deer that's on camera, at, like in a scrape or a plot, I would go to the woods that day like this. Yeah. I usually I already do on the 23rd, 24th, yeah. 25th. Well, let, let me ask you this, just because it's fun to speculate. And like, dude, I think Jeremy and I would love to believe them. Like it's, yeah. it's an interesting thing. And it's like, man, they're, they're sure as of, a lot of guys that we respect that like swear by it, you know, even the kill giants and add Andre to the list too. You know, there's, there's five, yeah. five or 10 guys we know that swear by it. Um, what, what do you think? Why, why can't they pick up on it? Like as far, like they recently did the, you know, giant, uh, collared deer study in Pennsylvania. Why, what are we missing as far as like, here's they're like, here's the fats, here's the stats. And then you have all these guys with proven track records on the other side, swearing that it's true. What, what are we missing? I have no idea. 
I don't know. That's above my pay grade. I just do you I think it's an it. age class thing, Bobby? Because I mean, obviously, like you and Ben, it's and it's a variable Lee, thing. Well, it's a time it, of year. It's an age class. And it's I, a location. I say that because of if there is a skeptic in me from a biology standpoint, right? There's not a shitload of mature bucks in Pennsylvania, right? I mean, think of the bucks that they call it in oh, Pennsylvania. Sure. They're probably a lot of one and two year olds. A three year old deer in the Midwest out here is running around every day in daylight somewhere. Yeah, yeah. A four year old deer is he's he's not running around he's definitely got yeah. a different vibe you know he's he, he he's definitely going to be out on those high pressure days generally you know um but when they cross that five they're just personally and again this is this is my you know opinion they're not necessarily smarter they're just an animal mm -hmm. you can't argue that a, a buck is smarter than a doe yeah, they just are wired differently, and they have a more precise set of triggers that make them walk in daylight. They're reclusive, but when you do see them, a lot of times they don't. They're just out there. Yeah, they're just out there. Right? Yeah. They're not acting like. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah, you know, I, some unicorn. They're I mean, a five, a four, four or five year old doe is more of a nightmare approaching my stand than a four or five year old buck. Yeah. And just, it's because they've interacted more with humans because they're wired to yeah. walk more in daylight yep. and then therefore they're more keen to it. So sometimes they almost seem wiser. So I just don't think they're smarter. I don't, I don't think you can argue that they're smarter. I just think they have more precise triggers that make them move in daylight. And, you know, once you kind of understand those triggers, like, so my, my approach to a season is like this October, I'm looking for, I'm looking for, I'm looking, I'm, I'm keying in on that. Every high pressure front, I'm super pumped about. Yep. Chances are, if they're unpressured, they're going to be doing what you're seeing them do at night in daylight on a high pressure front. So all those trump everything else. But when you can line that week up, like if I was planning a trip this year, I would be planning it based off that week. Because if you don't get quite as good environmental conditions, you still have the moon and the, and the buildup of testosterone sure. through the month. October in your favor so you're stacking odds mm -hmm. you know what I mean would you um, would you actually pick if you had to choose one of those two variables to depend on would you choose the moon or the environmental factors if you had the environmental by by tenfold yeah yeah okay hundred percent okay mm -hmm. like, so I would say most hunters are aligning themselves towards the environmental if they can sure. it's they're just naive it's hard to, to do because you can't look at the calendar yeah. today and say oh it's going to rain it's yeah. going to be this yeah if you've pressure. got a nine to five you're you're screwed <laughs> i mean let's let's be honest a good example of that like last year i brought my son youth season and we were sitting there and hadn't seen a moon a deer it was full moon it was that sunday youth season full moon kind of warm crappy environmental and he's getting antsy you know and we're sitting in the ladder and i keep telling he's like let's go let's go and like i'm like dude it's the full moon i know you don't understand this we have to sit as long as we can to last legal shooting light because that's our highest chance and we're sitting there and sure enough at the buzzer beater i hear a stick break and i literally look down and this this mature five-year-old eight-pointer like literally like sent from the heaven steps out like last light <laughs> just on two now, if I if I was if I didn't have a plan and mm -hmm. like a focus attention to that full moon, not a lot of deer movement, because it's you know rising right at sunset or whatever. If I didn't have if I wasn't in tune with that, I'd have already been out of the tree because he was driving me nuts. Sure, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and again, ten other people could have been sitting and not that wouldn't mm -hmm. have happened, but it's just stacking odds you know yeah that's that gut feeling we're talking about it's that's what kept you there yeah and i mean it's it's just the more you're in the woods the more you know you're around these deer and and you know that it is a huge advantage of the midwest over the east is that you're around mature bucks more there just are more of them you know and so being in the woods and being able to observe those deer or being able to even capture those deer on camera and align that with environmental or, or moon phase or whatever i mean you just have more data. If anything, you are becoming a more deadly hunter for mature bucks just because of the data input you get. To your point, Bobby, if I get one five-year-old every five years on my place in Pennsylvania, I mean, hell, man, I'm, I'm working on limited data there to try to kill that deer when yeah. he does show up. I'll give you a good example of the moon. Last year, me and Toby and Lee 
were up in Iowa working on on something, and it was I, I I think it was deer season. I think it was maybe October, and we were over at one of our project farms, and it was a warm day, and and that's why we were all up there anyway because it was kind of a crappy hunting day. And Lee was like, he he was talking about he had been talking about the ponds that he's he's been building. He's, mm-hmm. He likes them shallowing in the dirt, and so they can stand in them, walk in them, and he likes putting them on a green clover on a green source. And we're, we, somebody said something about the warm weather and, you know, the deer hunting suck. And he's like, he's like, oh, unless you have water holes on green, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. He goes, he goes, well, let me look at the moon. He looks, he pulls out his phone, looks at it for a second. And he goes, I'll have a, I'll have a mature buck on one of my water holes at 2.30 this afternoon. <laughs> at 2.32 or 3, he sends me and Toby a group text and says, right on time, smiley face. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, it's hard to, I mean, how do you argue with a guy like Ali? I mean, look at his, look at his portfolio. Well, why would you? I mean, we we're, I, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We're like, man, I, yeah. you know, we, we want to, we want to. Every, every hunting strategy works, just doesn't work all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that there's some, some over and out? I mean, I know I, I'm guilty of this. I maybe you, Jared. You're going to ask, do you think there's some over analysis? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're all guilty of that. And I call that, you know, the mental game of deer hunting. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a plan and you have to have your philosophies and you have to stick to them and you can't get rammy. It's one of the hardest things with deer hunting is the mental game. 98% of the time you should be feeling this like confusion. Like, am I doing right? It's normal. Yeah, because stuff's only awesome for like a very mm-hmm. small. Moment. Yeah, but you can't get rammy and start doing things that will hurt your odds. Yeah, just because you're 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 mentally unstable. I mean, me and my friend, or I used to lease her all around me, and we just oh man, we'd have the highs and lows. It was just yeah. hilarious. I think Rising's a good example of like that dude is about as aggressive of a of a big buck killer as I know, but he's super calculated with it. Like, I mean, he'll tell you, I'm going to go in and kill this buck, but he's got a strategy. It just seems like it's like, dude, that, I mean, you're in his bedroom. Like that's, that's pretty, but he just, he knows, he just knows, uh, you know? Yeah, and here's the thing about that. Like guys that are good, about, kill a lot of big deer. The, it starts with guys that are good at finding a big deer. You yeah. have to find them consistently to kill them consistently. When you find a six-year-old or seven-year-old deer somewhere, generally it's because he hasn't been pressured or whatever. The last three years I've been hunting on a piece that I had permission on. It was 20 acres in the, up in, in Pe- up north of Peoria. And, uh, you know, I, I arrowed a 190. I killed a 170-something, and I shot a 211 last year on a 20-acre permission piece that other people were hunting. Wow. And when you, when you find a piece – I, when other people were hunting, they were gun hunting at one one of the seasons. So okay. it's kind of like no pressure because nobody's there. Okay. But when I found these the big deer there the first year, like I I had a hell of a go around with a Garmin, not a Garmin, a different brand um, range finding bow sight. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, I I missed this deer. I spooked the deer. I screwed myself up. I missed him again. I hit. You know, it was bad. And, uh, but I couldn't run that deer out of there. I mean, you could, when you find that there's different types of pressure, but when you find a big deer and he's that old because he's lived there, you can make some mistakes and you can get aggressive and not push him out of there. He knows it. He knows his escape routes. It's kept him alive. It's a misconception. They are hard to run out of a place that they grew up and lived. Extremely yeah. hard. Now getting a deer to that age on a piece of property that, you own and are trying to manage that's a whole different conversation of pressure and that's where that's where it, it's a mental game because you don't get that deer on your personal piece of ground without some serious mm-hmm. plan in place and a lot of people you know and this gets back into the the habitat side of things and what i probably would have got to you know as we talk but the number one thing that you can do for your property is nothing yeah <laughs> it's not it's not this secret sauce stay like, stay away stay out of it when i go everybody's like oh you're here the habitat logging guy blah 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 we want to build this and do this and i start the conversation with 
if I gave you permission to hunt a thousand acres of public land in Iowa that is completely managed, grasses, TSI, food, but there's hunting pressure, or I let you hunt in a park downtown Ohio, thousand acres, Columbus, no hunting at all, no food, no TSI, no grasses, where would you rather hunt? Yeah. Sometimes people say Iowa mm -hmm. and I say, no, <laughs> no, you're you wrong. Park. <laughs> yeah. And why would you hunt the park? You'd hunt the park because of pressure. Yeah. If you could overlay pressure on a map, like a weather radar, you would find every big deer in the world. They can find it, whether it's a 10 acre patch or a thousand acre patch. Yeah. And so once I kind of get people understanding, like, all the stuff. Food Ex box, explain success. that real quickly, Bobby. You say when you overlay the pressure map, you'd find the deer outside of that where there is no well, pressure. Like, if, like when you look at a weather radar and you see like the highest concentration of precipitation. Yep. Yeah. If you could somehow overlay hunting pressure onto a map and see like a heavy red circle that meant there was zero hunting pressure, there'd be a giant in that hole. And yep. then there'd be a giant. Well, they find no pressure period i'll tell you That's what why you're that probably exists dude you freaking go to go to onyx go to like the mapping softwares that has all the here they are it there's, should there's, exist. there's all your hunters but i don't well, think it's a data layer yet there's a 500 million dollar idea for somebody just send mm -hmm. me a little check there you go bar. well i mean it's you're right i mean like we were just we drove through I've, got, I've got a perfect example if i can so we we hunted kansas yep last year yep last year we hunted kansas last year and, and jeremy's been going since 2013 i've been there for six or seven years um, we, you know, we have some leases and stuff, but we've, uh, since we've brought the dads out, Jeremy and I's dads comes with us. We put them on the leases and Jeremy and I go dive into public and the pressure's been getting worse and worse. And this past year we got another small piece. I mean, I, I don't know, it's a 20 acre track, something like that, um, that never gets hunted. It's real close to town, not a big town, but just outside of town, there's really nothing there. It's just, no. kind of, it's just kind of a tree line. And so we'd been hunting public. We'd been like just struggling and, and eventually got this small piece of permission. And when I went in there, I first of all, I threw a camera up and then I started hunting it immediately. And it was like, it was the most bizarre thing because these deer were just like laying out in the middle of nothing, like just in the, in the backyard of this old homestead that was there. It's like I was seeing, you know, and it's just like, there's just nobody here and they know that. And that's, they're just totally comfortable here. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, so that's, that's where I get people's mindset is without, it's like a food plot. It's the success of a food plot. I, my food plot program is so simple. It's all strategy. It doesn't really matter what you plant. Yes, it matters what you plant. You need standing food per every 150 or 200 acres and whatever. It's 90%, 7% strategy. It's, it's how it's shaped. It's, you know, like you could plant brassicas in July and then the same mix in August. And it it's for two totally different strategies, different times of year. You know, it's all about strategy. So everything starts with strategy. You can do all the cool habit. Like I have people call me and they're like, I had so-and-so come out and do this habitat thing. And I've got the most beautiful grasses. And I got the, but I am kind of realizing that I can't kill these deer and I think I might need help. So then, like I said, the number one thing you can do is, is nothing. It's, it's just leave your farm as a no hunting sanction pressure, you know, just yeah. no pressure or something. Make sure you have to recreate that wildlife refuge, that sanctuary situation. And then you have to create setups that you can get in and out of and essentially treat your farm like a glass house and put as little pressure as possible on it. Hunt it effect efficiently and effectively, but make it be that that wildlife refuge. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's wide open hardwoods. I mean, I have a logging company and we do a lot of stuff for deer hunting stuff. But it doesn't matter if it's wide open. I mean, that place I was hunting these last few years, wide open hardwoods. I mean, wide open. They love that. They can see forever. It's really hard to hunt. Um, it's all strategy and pressure. That's the number one thing. And that's a big sacrifice. But I mean, obviously, you've got kids. Mine are 7 and 11. Like, they want to be on my farm. Like, they want to just go and, and walk around and fish and, you know, see things. And there's a, there's a time and a place for it during the year. There's also a time and a place for it where it's like, listen, we're not going to just go walk around the farm today in well, September. It's not, it's not just them either. I mean, dude, it's it's us. Like, yeah. we, we want to dive in. We want to hunt the farm. Like yeah. you, you Or manage you the farm or do whatever. The farm. Yeah. I want to go into that pinch that's way in there. And sometimes yeah. that's... And so... Yeah. So like what you said about Kansas, like when I do consults and stuff for people and we do consults, um, I tell people and I can kind of tell the guys that are, are a little rammy and stuff. I'm like, get yourself a lease up the road, go up there and, and just 
do your thing. It's okay? a good idea. Release. Yeah. yeah. Just release up there. Yep. But I'm telling you, down here, you got to do this. Yeah. Because you're going to, this is all for nothing if you don't. And so, um, you know, that seems, that seems to work pretty well. Um, yeah, it's a good idea because people want to be on the farm. You know, it's a, it's a big investment for them and to, you know, it's, it's hard for them to comprehend like, okay, you've bought it. It's yours. Don't be on it. Well, dude, well, dude, my, my, my farm in Ohio is a perfect yeah. example. So my, my parents uh, own this farm. My dad owns this farm and we've got, it's me, my dad, my uncle, one of his good buddies, uh, one of my other buddies, you know, over the course of time, it's a big farm, you know, but it's, it gets a lot of pressure and we well, like, even just your mom and dad driving around, driving around in the summer evening. Cause they, they just, you know, doing farm chores. Yeah. They love it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And we put, you know, and, we put a lot of time and money into that still. Like we, you know, I planted a 12 acre soybean field on it. I've got some box blinds on it. And it's because we enjoy doing that. It's a lot of fun. The reality is we kill all of our biggest deer, not on that farm. I, I've went and gotten permission from surrounding farms. And there's some other parts of the farm that like, just frankly, I don't promote. And, and we just, we don't do anything to them. Uh, Dad killed 162 and a half inch eight point on just the it was like the only farm that we didn't go on and it's got there's no habitat there there's no nothing <laughs> and that's where that deer was living now obviously i say that you you do have to do stuff and you do have to set it up but you got to do it in a way that you know you're not out there every weekend and and it's you know you're yeah. just you're getting in you're getting out now on the flip side of it i will tell you that if you have a massive amount of presence especially on a bigger piece like the Lukoskis or whatever, it kind of goes the other way. Or Kansas, like our ranch in Kansas, you know, there's oil field guys in and out of there. There's all kind of ranchers. Talk like, about Grant Woods, dude. I mean, you know, you see a guy that's like constantly driving the roads. It's like the deer almost come out to see the trucks, you know? And that's a different deal. But when we're talking about like a typical farm in the Midwest, you know, mm. that the average guy is going to own, yeah, it's just going to be better off, you know, with a light amount of pressure. And, um, you know, so, and again, that's just my, my take on it. And, and now going into the real estate side of things for guys that are wanting to start buying stuff, um, and set your bar high. Don't say, Oh, well, I'm just going to buy a 20. Be like, well, I'm, I'm going to get in the game and I'm going to buy a 20 and then I'm going to roll it and I might save up and buy another piece. But the ultimate thing you can do is if you have not bought a piece yet is, is buy small pieces it is way better to own 1080s than one 800. When you set up an 80 or a 20 or a 30 or a 40, and you have one standing food source and one killer setup, if you have each one of those 80s is essentially, if you do your job and you have no pressure and you have food and stuff, you're sampling probably a thousand acres or whatever. Right. So if you have 1080s, you're sampling 10,000 acres. Mm. That ups your odds of finding a giant deer it hedges you against neighbors it hedges you against disease um and then you can start building a portfolio so mm -hmm. okay if you're buying 40s and 60s and 80s and 20s this one's not really performing i'm gonna roll this one this one's killer ah this one's and you can start and yeah before you know it when you have when you have a handful of smaller farms and it could be five 10 acre pieces it could be it, whatever your odds are just go through the roof when you have, and so many people think that they need to have this giant big yep. deer factory, but yeah. odds are not in your favor. Yeah. I, every like single guy that's been really successful at killing big deer has said that to us. Well, and I mean, we look at your farm or we learned that in Kansas a lot. We had a lot of ground. I mean, you know, between the public and the leases, we had a thousand plus acres that we were hunting. It, we were hunting the same damn deer <laughs> the whole time. Like, and if those deer were locked down or they weren't moving, you were screwed. There, well, there was nowhere else to go. There was nowhere else to sample. Or if it, you know, we got hit with EHD in that area, you, you were shit out of luck. It's the classic, like all of our eggs were in that basket That's and it. it just didn't pan out. Yeah. yeah. And also if you're starting from square, from scratch and you're trying to get in the game and you have a goal of having a cabin or a place to stay, put it on a, a piece in a situation like with a pond or whatever, where you got like three acres that you can peel off of it. So if that farm doesn't work out, you can don't get emotional about any piece of ground. It, your goal is to shoot big deer, you know, sell it, keep, keep home base separate. So you're not glued to something, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And in my opinion, if I was going to start out 
I, and I was a non-resident, I was not going to move to Iowa. I would buy in Hancock or, um, or, uh, uh, is it, uh, Mercer, uh, up just North of Hancock, somewhere right there by Keokuk in Iowa. So I mean, Toby joke, it used to be the golden triangle. And we're like, we're going to, we're going to make this like the golden circle, like the <laughs> new golden circle. Because when you, when you have a P, when you have home base right there, you can have, you know, a 40 in Iowa that you late muzzle yeah. order hunt, like three out of four years, 15, 20 minutes away. You can pop into Missouri yep. in 15, 20 minutes. So you can have like umpteen more buck tags than you'll ever use and in options and gun seasons and blah, blah, blah. Yep. And uh, you get two bucks state of I of Illinois. So like, in my opinion, like if I was starting from scratch, that's where I do. And plus there's giant deer up there. I mean, hey, yeah. Uh, that's crazy, you know, man. Well, you know, Bobby, you talk about, let's say, 10 years of, of you in this, and you've obviously in a, seen a giant transition in land prices in Illinois, right? I mean, look yep. at even the last three years and what prices have done. And so the the farms you've held in your portfolio look really good, the ones especially below, you know, before 2020. You know, but since then, I think a lot of people will say, and Jared and I have questioned it, and we've kind of come to the realization, again, it's kind of getting the game, but... You know, they're like, man, like, you know, five, six, seven, an acre in some of these places seems like, how am I ever going to make money on them? All right. Yeah. The same farmer said that when the land was 800. Right. You know, that's the just... hard thing to fathom. And that's what we've come to the realization with is like, listen, you know, it, it, it's going to, people will say they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's going to go down. I don't, I personally don't see land prices ever going back down. I think everything going on in the world makes our market stronger. Agree. It's funny because I you can feel the market just kind of like the deer. Uh, <laughs> you can feel the market when you're in it so heavily. It's hilarious because like you know a month ago I don't know, all of a sudden it feels like it just stalls. And it's yeah. Like, Is this the end? Yeah. But it usually like it's literally as dumb as something comes out in the news mm -hmm. and it's doom and gloom and the world's going to end and everybody pauses. Yep. And they're like, "Is the world going to end?" And then, like a week later, the phone starts ringing. And everybody's buying and selling stuff again. Yep. So it's like the weirdest thing. And it ebbs and flows with the market. Like any day that the market takes a takes a dip, people mentally are like. But so many people lost a lot of wealth in the markets, and they don't have any control over their destiny. It's, it's, it's the best place in the world to put money right now. Literally, is in our yeah. market. It's head. It's hedged by the wreck. It's hedged by the fact that it's land and they're not making any more. And it's hedged by commodities, which in times like these, generally, I mean, you look at all the wealthiest families in the world, yep. you know, they are pouring money into ag right now. And we as hunters are in this crazy space that like, you know, we're, it's not, we're not just buying it to shoot big deer. Like mm -hmm. I hear people all the time, these people pay this much money to shoot big deer. I'm like, yeah you're missing the point you got to get in the game yeah you know it's it is such a great market and i don't think it's going to drop um, no. there's too many people there's too many people that that their property values went doubled almost in the last few years and they have so much they're not going to sell farms for a loss not the masses the only thing that would affect our market is a huge flood of supply which i don't see no and like you know i just I've done a lot, of, a couple of things here with a lot of the head guys at Whitetail Properties here recently. And, you know, I was talking to, uh, I think it was their CFO and he's like, basically the transactions are, are the same. And the numbers of transactions, the dollars are just less because now the guy that could afford 300 is buying a 150. So like mm -hmm. the demand is still there. It's just shift. It's shifted yeah. down. To yeah. One, you know. Well, and I think, you know, as this kind of, recreational side continues you know some of these farms that were 300s are now two 150s or you know something was a 320 and now it's you know four 480s like it, it's just it's kind of nature over time i mean at one point there were there was a farm that was a thousand acres and now you know multiple people multiple people, people own that farm yeah and so it's it's just how the the world works on that side um but yeah i mean i i think that as people start to look at that and they kind of have like oh you know i Dude, we, you wouldn't, I mean, Jared and I are agents, right? The number of people that will comment on one of our listings and say, well, I'm just going to wait for land to go back to 3,000 an acre. You'll die. Maybe waiting there for a while. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> You're not ever going to 
get in the game. I mean, I am in the game, and you do not find stuff under 3,000 an acre. Mm -hmm. Winky was the guy who told us, he said, if you want to stop the price, you better buy it. Like, buy it now, and, the and that's to, the only way to stop it from continuing to go up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just how it it's is. Like, uh, you go to McDonald's with the family, it's 35 bucks. It's crazy, I dude. Come, I had a kid come wash my truck one night after school, and it was 200 bucks. <laughs> I used to wash people's trucks when I was a kid for $8. I know. I took two took, bucks if your tires clean. I took I Jared mean, to Chick fil A. It cost us like $100. Seriously, it just doesn't—it I mean, doesn't make yeah. sense. It's like our dollar is less valuable than ever before, but things are also more expensive than ever. But it's like, yeah, it, it sure seems like we're—that's not a good thing. <laughs> and the scary part of that is, the working class—they're not making proportionally more with all this inflation. No, so absolutely not. No, I mean, I would like to help all everybody get in a better place, like. The number one thing, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, well, this is out of touch and it must be nice and blah, 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 all that same stuff. You have to change your mindset. Like yeah. Right now, you have to say, well, this guy was making 200 bucks playing music a night in a bar. And then he, he went to doing all this stuff like you can do it. We live in the United States like you can do it. Um, and you the first step and the hardest step you have. The two hardest steps are you have to make a mental mm -hmm. decision. You're going to get in the game and you are going to go and figure out a way to buy your fees for a piece of property. And then the second thing is you have to get over the, the fear and, and actually do it and just trust the process and trust that it's going to, it's going to work out. I mean, there's not a lot of people that buy, that buy land and then get, you know, totally like go bankrupt. Yeah. Especially space anyway there, there's even a lot of people i think that uh like are financially very well off and but just like their their interests their uh comforts are in, in other things well they just i know a lot of people that could afford a, a lot of really good properties and i'm like what are you doing they're just like, doing what they've been told their entire life which is have a 401k get to retirement age do do all the things it, it's it's and no knock to him it's kind of the dave ramsey mindset be debt free yeah. debt is bad right and it's like you that's can, another thing <laughs> That's another thing is so many people grow up and, and they learn that debt is bad. Yes. Well, yeah, credit card debt, buying yes. bows and hunting equipment, that's bad. Well, but watch yourself leverage. there, Bobby. I mean, bows and hunting equipment is kind of right. a necessary. That's called a write-off. That's what you're, you're, that you're talking about, right? There's write-offs and there's yeah. investments. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. I just went off on this tear and I just bought all these vintage elite bows, like all the 2006s and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I bought like seven of them. But they're like $150, $200 on eBay. Yeah. They're some of the greatest bows ever made. <laughs> they're a great deal, great value. Oh, yeah. shit, that's funny. But you're right. I mean, credit card debt, things like that are bad, right? You can't, you can't have that stuff. But debt in the form of a mortgage against an asset, like a piece of land, people just, they haven't been, they haven't been told that that could be beneficial to them. Yes. That's the hardest part. I Yep, and I, 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 it's OPM. It's other people's money. I leverage that bank as hard as I can, but my strategy is a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So, I want as much cash as possible to give me a big backbone to go out there and do deals. Mm -hmm. Do you worry? I mean, obviously, because of the way things are right now, um, how much it, does the interest rates affect your turnover on your properties or speed of turnover? Uh, it's just changed, you know, some of the strategies and, and, uh, you know, you got to get in and out quicker, which, you know, makes the tax deal mm -hmm. tougher, you know, if you're, you're into that short term, um, period, but yeah, you got to pay attention to it cause it'll, it'll burn you. It'll, it'll take a deal and make it a, a bad deal, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I've been trying to f just trying to buy very, uh, very safe stuff, you know, um, just if you buy good hunting farms, you'll never get stuck. Yeah. Good hunting farms will always sell. Yeah. And I said good hunting farms, meaning visually a good hunting farm, because that's how most people define a good hunting farm. Aesthetically. I define, there's different ways of defining it. Like, is it how cool, how good it looks? Is yeah. it how good it looks? Or is it how the caliber of deer? That's yeah. what I'm at. Let, let me because ask 
there's a disconnect. Let yeah. me ask you this, Bobby, because this is something that has come up for Jeremy and I as we look at. Uh, obviously, these are investment properties, but but that's the main thing we're looking at is how how good of a hunting farm is this? Uh, that's obviously driven first and foremost by the deer that are there. So, like a, a concern, like a, a consideration that we have, I guess, is what if we buy this bang and hunting farm? Yes, maybe it has some other income. Yeah, maybe maybe some timber, some some things like that. But primarily, like the reason for this value, the reason it's six thousand dollars an acre or whatever, um, is that because there's potential to kill booners here. Um, yeah. it, it seems like a, a, a main concern would be, like you said earlier, disease. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and maybe there's some strategy around, you know, buying multiple parcels or not, not getting too big in one area. But like, w- yep. what happens? What happens? You, you know, you, you think you, you really take off a big bite and that's into, uncontrollable, into a right? banging I mean, hunting farm and then CWD or EHD just wipes it out, you know, and you're left with this massive investment. And, uh, well, you know, there, there's kind of a couple different questions there, but there's a buyer for every piece. I mean, from the the weekend warrior that's wanting to come out of Chicago and he just wants a place to bring his family, he wants to ride four wheelers, he wants to pond a fish and he wants to go sit in a tree stand on opening day gun season. Like mm-hmm. there's that, that, and it goes all the way to the far end, which is like over the top developed, die hard, crazy deer hunter guy. And there's, you know, and then there's a, you know, there's, that that guy there, there's only so many people that actually speak that language, you know, to the to the level, you know, of, of that development. You know, that's kind of hard to explain that. But um, and then as far as like, I, I guess the the answer to the other part of that is like that's why that's why it's good to have multiple things going in multiple areas, like you said, because you know you're hedging against that. Mm-hmm. And like I said. There's always a buy. I mean, I my Fulton stuff that I got on my on my uh, page there. Um, I just sold forty of acres of it to a neighbor. She came to me. She's got horses. She's not even. She doesn't hunt. She's not going to hunt. And then I had another guy call, and he wanted eighty acres of it. And he, uh, they, they're not hunters either. They wanted a place to go and hang out and have a fire and maybe build a pond to fish with the grandkids and ride ATVs. Yeah, and then my goal on that piece was to keep a tillable field that had about five acres of woods that had a killer hunting spot. And I was going to keep that in my longer term portfolio because a cost basis would be way under what it was worth and it would essentially service its own debt. Um, so like in that situation, I started out full blown, like, here's the plan, you know, me, Toby and Mark talking about the design and stuff and putting it out there, you know, cause that's kind of how we are, the whitetail group marketing approach, you know, of our farms is essentially a free console. Yeah. Um, so it's a plan. And then we have a price. If you want that plan fully executed, you know, here's a price per acre with a free plan. Um, it's market value. And then here is the price fully developed. It might say plus $237 an acre if you want. Mm-hmm. Fully developed. And then these people come to me and they, they're not even hunters. So like, mm-hmm. you're not going to get trapped. It's still land. Um, sure. It's going to suck for you as a hunter, but yeah. you can't, like, I got other guys that'll, you know, they'll hire us to consult and it's like, they're like, what do I do? Blah, blah, blah. Should I, it's like, just sell it and start over. Yeah. You could spend 15 years trying to get this and there's no guarantees. Like. I think that's know. the hard mindset for people. Um, even like Jared and I, and, and like, let's say our Western Pennsylvania, like we've got ground that we're selling as realtors that it's like, that's a good piece of hunting ground. There's no buyers for it. It's too big, costs too much money, whatever. Uh, and it's just because of the culture here, you take that same piece and you throw it in Western Illinois or Eastern Iowa or whatever. Like I'm sure there's a shitload of buyers for and that, that's our part of pennsylvania <laughs> specifically like there are recreational buyers in pennsylvania a lot of them i'm sure you know they're looking primarily up north like the, the big woods you yep. know we're or they want of, some sort of ag component to it yeah and we're just outside of pittsburgh you know yeah. so it's yeah same with ohio and, and these other places i mean you, if you've got a piece of hunting ground you know, people will buy it i mean there there are buyers out there you know you know, it's got to be for the right price too, right? But um, location, location, location. Yep, that's it, man. I think that's a big one. So, you know, when Bobby, when you guys are looking, let, let's say you personally, right? Um, you know, what are you looking for in a in a piece to buy for the Whitetail Group's program, basically? So there's 
there is no like one size fits all that we look for. Mm-hmm. So I think kind of what sets us apart, um, you know, being in the game and as a, as a recreational developer and stuff is like, we, we just see value where other people don't see it. We're not like going out and like buying farms, like way under what the market says it is. Mm-hmm. Like that's hard to do in today's age. Like, absolutely. It's not like I'm going to, it's not like I'm going out there and there's a farm that's it's like market value, the appraisal or everybody, it would say it's 5,000 and I'm out there like buying those for 3,000. Like or, these wholesalers you know. are out there. These, they're, you know, they're a dime a dozen now, these land wholesalers who go out and buy a property. A lot they're of times, sales. in our opinion, are, are crappy properties. Yeah, trash. And then just trying to flip it out for a profit. They don't, you know. They're tax sales. They're forgotten yeah, properties. So, yeah, is what those. So are. I we just basically see value where other people don't, and that comes in different forms. It comes in the form of, of timber value. Obviously, we have our own logging operation. We also have a brand and 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 do timber projects in a way that don't hurt the farm. That actually they they add value to it. Sure. Timber in our part of the world, it doesn't necessarily add value. No appraiser is accounting for timber value, mm-hmm. and like I say to people, like sometimes somebody goes to one of our farms and it, and we don't log every one of them, but let's say we did log it. Mm-hmm. They might say, well, you log. And I'll say, if I brought you to a farm that was a overgrown cattle farm and it was just nothing but invasives, it was a, a nightmare to, you know, a forester, but it had mega giant deer on it because they love that crap. And then I brought you to a farm that had wide open, beautiful hardwoods which one would you pay more money for? Our market is is based around that. Yeah. So it's based Big around deer. hunting, yep. retail deer hunting. So, you know, um, and I don't know what got me going down that that. Uh, well, it's hard for people. There. It's hard for people to get over that. So, Jared and I. Well, you're talking about seeing the elements of value that other people don't see. Yeah, Jared and I walked yeah. your Shelby County piece, right? Of which you guys, I mean, have taken some timber off of that piece, and it's hard for somebody to visualize that in two years where you've cut timber is going to be thick, nasty bedding and browse. It's, it's just, you know, and, and that's the, that's the foresight. I think somebody has to have that frankly, they're probably leaning on you, man, as the whitetail group to say, you know, Bobby, I I just want to kill big deer. You know, what, what am I looking for? Yeah. And like, I mean, (laughs) and back to the original question, like, if I'm looking for my own self, you just don't know. That's why you have to have, like I get to take these farms for a test drive, depending on the time of year. A lot of times I get to run cameras and I get to know what's there and stuff. But like, I'll give you an example. I had a farm last winter that I owned. I did a timber project on it. I excavated, put some plots in this and that. Um, and I sold it to a a guy. Um, and there's mega giants on it. I mean, what in the world, like right in, in, in the same vicinity of, uh, piles of other farms i've owned that didn't and it's like dang it yeah (laughs) so you know even i i had another farm one time down here that i I bought and uh i never even got to see the thing because i was out of town and and a neighbor came hot and heavy just pounding the door down wanting to buy it and i sold it i'm like geez there's a 200 inch deer on it. So jokes on me. And it's, <laughs> it's been like that multiple times. Like I, you don't know all you, you just, it's just probability. You know, you just, you have to, like I said, I think the, the only thing you can do is try to acquire. And it doesn't just have to be what you buy. It's like the piece I've been hunting. That I got permission on anywhere. You can run a trail camera. You have to run a trail camera. You have to cast a wide net to up your odds of finding one. Permission pieces, leases, and ground you own. The ground you own, you have the ability to say, okay, but rather than buy 200, I'm going to buy four, you know, 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the only thing you can do is let probability um, work for you. And in, in doing consults for people, you know, Mark Luster goes out and does the on site. I get on a Zoom. We help people, you know, design their farms and set their farms up. Man. Some of the deer on people's farms, it's it's crazy. And we get to see like, well, there's giant, but it's not like, okay, this whole area of Illinois just has giants. It's just that one farm because something is going on in the neighborhood. And, you know, like this guy up there in Knox County, I mean, do you want to talk about some giants? Holy cow. 
he had giants mm -hmm. on his farm. Um, but I owned a farm like, you know, a few miles north of there and it was not the know, same. Just... That, dude, that trail camera history is like, uh, it, it's irreplaceable, but it's almost like, you know, we, we talked about there. There might even been a sound clip or something from a podcast we did talking about, like, once somebody knows, you know, because everything we've talked about is like, well, I see value where other people don't. When you see a trail camera picture of a 200 inch deer, there's no, nobody's going to be like, well, I don't know. Is, is a good, you know, is there a big deer here or not? That's there's, there it is. There's your proof right there. And trail so, cams is the number one thing to add value to the property if there's good deer. huge well and it's and it's also from a buyer perspective you know it's like it, it's a double-edged sword because it's like as much as i want to know that there's a uh, boon or 200 inch deer there i don't want the person selling it to me to know that <laughs> right <laughs> yeah right because i want to get it for a i want to get it for a, a good price too you know yeah. but it's so it's like i don't know somewhere in the middle and it's the funny because like i i criticize some properties where it's like man if i'm buying this as a deer hunting property it's priced for 200 it, but you don't have pictures you don't of, have or a pictures, history of 200. yeah to justify it you know or it, no offense to them because i think a lot of these real estate agents they're just not hunters but, you know, if I'm in, you know, Western Illinois and you drop in several pictures of two-year-olds in there that aren't like super giant two-year-olds, then I'm like, well, if that's the best you got, I ain't well, and they're it. just, they're <laughs> looking at properties you have for sale, you know, white tail property, even here in our territory, you know, uh, I know for a fact people look at our listings and they're like, they, they don't even have the most basic comprehension of what would be different about it. They're like, well, it's, here it is. And here's that one. And it looks similar. And so here's the price, you know, and it's, they're, right. they're not that's even close exactly. to the same farm. That goes back to there's so many different buyers, you know. When you're yeah. talking about the elite guys, yeah, they want to see they want to see big deer, but there's no guarantees. I yeah. mean, it is just the weirdest thing. A lot of these conversations about like what's the best county. Like I'll hear a lot of people yeah. say, "Oh, Pike County, Pike County shot out." Well, I know of like three <laughs> like mega two hundreds that were shot last year in in Pike. Yeah. You know, so it's it's like um, you know, it just well, this, think, right I, here around my house. I used to. Um, uh, you know, lease it and hunt kind of with my good buddy who owns it for years. And we kind of had this area that we call the bottom and then that area that we called down South and that area that we called over East, the bottom looked the best. I mean, hands down by far, we never had a buck over 165 down South. I shot a 178 inch eight with a split two. That was like 205 the year before wow. he killed a 196 typical we killed like a 180 something. My dad killed a 172. This was on like a 50 acre piece of ground over the course of like <laughs> three years. Wow. And then, and then just, it just stopped. Stop. And then over East, it looks the worst. I mean, it doesn't, if I brought you there and said, you're going to hunt here, you'd be like, I'm going home. Um, but we just didn't pressure it. And those deer would come in there. And then once they were there, like late season or whatever, you know, and I shot a big, big typical over there. So, but that was pretty much the only one that came. So this is a 700 acre area that's kind of like in three wings. Yeah. And you had one wing that might as well have been like Decatur County, Iowa. And and that might as well have been, you know, like upstate New York, you know. So it's yeah. like, wow, it's just so hard. It's just so hard. You know? Yeah. Well, and I think in today's society, because I, I told Jared I was looking, I don't know, the last couple of days I was going through like Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young records. What, it's we're, like, deep, we're deep in it right yeah. now. Bobby. I mean, you know, some of the road trips have been taken here and stuff and we're, it, we're on the hunt. You know, nobody, nobody's submitting <laughs> their, nobody's submitting their box to the record books, right? Which I could have told you. I yeah. mean, who, I mean, who it, does that? But you got to at least check it out because if you look at that, you see Pike and Adams and Fulton, like all at the top of these lists and not saying that those aren't producing giants because they are but you know you hear rumors about well so and so killed 200s it's like oh really it's like that picture's not leaking out anywhere right because frank and and for good reason he don't want anybody to know yeah and those are tend to be your more serious guys that are quieter about it and the other thing is that's skewed i mean it goes back to the probability thing there's more hunters there's uh -huh. more serious hunters there's more types of guys that would enter something in the record types, books types hunting. of guys is big man i feel like those pikes and whatever that's like that's drawn out your minnesota your pennsylvania guys who are like you know oh boone Crock, it's a big deal i'm gonna put that in the book you know it's those other places that aren't as widely promoted that like the the locals like the the, the true chasers are they're not gonna publish that anywhere promote it anywhere no i mean there's there's multiple 200s killed here in brown county illinois that i know of uh, last year and you know they're always around you just you know that but i i i like a lot of the sleeper areas you know i just mm -hmm. i like you know i like 
when my pots and stuff are more powerful because there's not a standing food source next door and everywhere yeah. else, you know, but yeah. there's, there's some just killer areas. Well, dude, we Illinois. just, we just had uh, Josh Bomar on who obviously has a ton of ground in Iowa and stuff. And it's, it's funny. He was sharing like his, he's like, here's my number one secret. He's like, I can't believe I'm sharing this with anybody. He's like, I go to like the ghetto. I go to the slums. I go to like the, you know, that where it's brown, it's down counties. He's like, I want all of my neighbors to be shooting the first year that they see and not investing in their land so that I can go in and make it, you know, where the deer with the most currency wants to come in and live. He's like, that's my yep. secret to killing 200 this year. <laughs> I would 100% agree with that. Yeah. That's where so I've wild. been spending a lot, of, a lot of my time the last several years, and it's just because that's where the trail camps told me to go, was, uh, up in Marshall County, Illinois. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about mega giants? Mm. I had a deer on there that was, <laughs> I'd say the general consensus, this was about four years ago when he was five, was probably two, between 210 and 215 typical. Jeez. Probably would have net, and that deer was swimming across the Illinois River. Wow. So when he felt like he was gone, he was gone. Uh, wow! So he, 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 yeah, but that same year, I had 185 inch deer on that farm, and uh, and then you know I started hunting a few miles south of there, same same area. And um, I think the I think the hardest part for guys um, who are ate up with it, to, to your point earlier, is like they just if they feel like they've got a chance at a deer. They, you know, it's like the Tommy boy scene with the, you know, the, yeah. the biscuit or whatever, where he's just like, love and I it. crash yeah. it. <laughs> and that's what happens, right? That's what happens with their property it. because they immediately are like, okay, I'm going to TSI this. I'm going to plant this. I'm going to do this. And then even during the season, I'm going to pivot this. I'm going to, uh, and they're just, they're on it. They're on it. They're on it. And they start to where they're doing more harm than good for that property. Again, to Bobby's point, you got to set it up. But there's a point to where you're over loving the thing to where you're doing more harm that's, than that's good. That's the hardest thing, dude. That's the yep. uh, spot Glasgow where I killed yep. my deer the past two years. It's like it's a little permission place. It's I don't know. It's 80, 100 acres, mm -hmm. and like we don't uh, we don't ever go you in put there anymore. Two food plots and a box mine, and it's like I killed, it is. killed my first booner out. This is in Ohio. Killed my first booner out there two years ago. And it's like, that's what it is. It's just, we don't ever go in there. And I killed him on the first set or second set. And it's, we, I don't have a whole lot of those opportunities. Like everywhere we hunt is, it gets pressure. Yeah. It's hunted. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's like the farm you guys walked. I mean, you kind of got an example, like it's 80 something acres and really all that farm really needs. And again, sometimes when we're setting farms up, we'll talk to people. And a lot of times people will have us looking for a farm for them. And then when we buy it, We'll develop it for them and we'll develop it like to their yeah. style. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not a serious style. It's just like them and their parents and their kids and they all, they want lots of blinds. And they, so it's not always like the diehard deer yeah. dude that we're building to, but like that farm is a good example. That's a one hit wonder. You will kill any deer on that farm out of one spot. That period. green, to, the green to green spot where the box farm would be. In yeah. Perfect access, perfect egress. That switch will get tall. Yeah. We use one of our corner boxes. Yeah. There'll be a, a, a diversion fence, a hemp row. I mean, it's just, he's, uh -oh. he's probably going to be quartered into the wind on a high pressure front with a northwest wind. And dude, that bedding uh, down in that. It's easy to see when we stood there. And look, it's funny because we walked it without your pins. Like we just walked it and we're like, that's, that's the spot. That's the spot. And I think we were like four for five or whatever it is. Like we walked it and we're like, oh yeah, look, he had a pen there. Yeah. <laughs> we walked right in at the the smaller food plot on, on the end there. On the north side. Uh, on the north side. And then cut in right on the left, right where that gate's at. And I was like, dude, this is the spot. <laughs> Southwest one right here. That little, that little red oak and the cliff behind it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's disgusting. That, now, that's, now that's a killer spot, even with no food plot, with the, anything south, like a southwest wind in yes. the rut. Blowing Absolutely. down that road. And they're cruising the upwind side of all that south facing. Oh, yeah. game over. Game over. Yeah. Game over. Yeah. No 100%. hunting strategy. No development. No manipulation needed. I, mean, I think I I we I thought those two spots. The one the one that I and who knows, dude. You spent a lot more time in Illinois than I do. But the one spot that I felt strongly about that you didn't have marked is uh, it, in the bottom. If you look at it on a map, you can. It's it's directly. Uh, 
Oh, how to describe it. There's basically a pinch. It's where the two, there's, there's, you know, that, that south facing timber by the spot we just talked about, that brushy stuff comes down and yep. meets the timber from that other. There's a bunch of squirrely, uh, draws. Yeah. Uh, basically everything comes together, right? Yeah. There. It comes together right there. It, and it's, there's a, there's a cut through it, almost like a, you know, it's not a logging if road. If you're coming but... from the north, it's maybe 50 yards before you get to that timber access up the knob. Mm hmm. Yep. And then you've got yep. those pockets of all of that thick grasses down in that bottom. Yeah, I mean, everything's, yeah. Yeah. The canary just, grass around it. Yeah. Basically. The deer are going to just pinch right through there every time. Yep. So, like, and, and, and now here's a good example of like perception, like uh, the stroke of the brush. And everybody's got a stroke of the brush. I can almost guarantee like Ben would be hitting that thing and, and, you know, cause he'd get right down in there with him. Oh, yeah. For me in my style of hunting, what I would do, cause that's like the epicenter, like mm -hmm. that's the core. I'll treat it like a game of, you know, the tortoise and the hare yep. and I'll keep pressure low and I'll bounce in on those, those right nights on the edges, on the edges. And this is kind of an exaggerated example, but when I would dive into the heart like that, when the risk was in reward, when all of a sudden the reward tipped, versus a risk and i gun hunt i love gun hunt mm -hmm. is opening day gun i'd be perched over that baby sure yeah like that's when the risk reward to me that's yeah. when i dive in for other than that i would treat it like a glass house and i if i didn't have them killed in one of them two spots beforehand i'd be shocked especially yeah. down there where there's not the food and not the plots everywhere agreed yeah the, no. see the I, I do agree it's a killer spot but sometimes killer spots can be they're the backfire. Yeah, yeah. killer in the other way. You, you yeah. push them out. See the the core of that November property. 8th. Yeah. yeah, the core of that property to me, and I don't know what if what you had envisioned in terms of access, but would be getting down to that bridge, getting in the river, and going three quarters of the way back that property. You know, it's pretty close to where you guys were talking about that pinch on the east piece. I, is that how yeah. you envisioned accessing that? Or I watched your video on that too. There, there's more coming around the knob from their property. You 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 definitely could. Again, you know. Um, that would probably be, you know, stuff is cranking. I, ha I would have to have the risk reverse reward. On the other side of the creek, there's a pinch there. We saw it. It is definitely. We stood right there. It is de definitely risk reward. I mean, and the access, that allows you to dive into the heart of it earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. Now, whether there's a spot like that on, on this side, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't go all the way back to that corner. Um, Mark may have when he was down there. I didn't go all the way back to that corner of that side mm -hmm. just because it did. It I, looked good. You know, we, I, we did. What was, I it? was kind of, he's talking to about me the, again. The corner where it meets the fence line. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a pinch back there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it comes out of those grass. There's a heavy crossing for sure. Yeah, And the neighbors, that property to the South, his, yep. his, uh, kind of like high wall closes in on that towards the Creek. I'd say they're crossing the Creek there. Maybe 30% more than they are yes. at, at the pinch that you guys talked about. Send me some pins. <laughs> oh, we, we marked them all. It's yeah. literally right where that uh, southern yeah. fence line meets the river. Yep. That's where the creek. Dude, you, the, some of the, and I mean, you know, when we get in it, we, we go after Send it. Me some pins. When we were in that, we, we were in that tall bottom, all that grass. How many beds stuff. did we count? Oh my God, dude. 20, the number of beds. beds in that bottom yeah. were just out. It was insane. L let me ask you this. It's like the Sahara down there. Oh, dude, it was so bad. Let me ask you this. That's all canary grass, right? Did we identify that properly? So, so what yeah. happens with that? I mean, that's it's like kind of an invasive, right? Like I struggle with that. It's obviously pro providing a ton of cover right now. Is that something yeah. you would replace long term or what do you think? You know, if you had the time and energy and stuff, that stuff is so hard to to kill and rid of yeah. but if you could get that bottom into solid switch it'd be ridiculous mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time you know i mean i shot 180 something inch deer in hancock county that was living in a bottom it looked exactly like that and i'd watch him from a distance out there screwing around and one day he decided to come up there actually one day he decided to come up there and get missed <laughs> and then that was his decision <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> And then that was the second time I missed him. But the first time I missed him was in November. I hit a limb. The limb is hanging on the wall under the deer. Um, but then that was the second time I missed. That was a long season. I mean, whoa. Um, and then, but then I, I did end up finally shooting him. Uh, and, but to the point, he lived in a bottom that looked exactly like that. Yeah. No pressure. Just give it to him. 
is is all the intrusion and the years lost of waiting for it to change and mm-hmm. and probably and not. then having a deer grow up there i mean is it worth it if there's no pressure in there yeah i mean i think you get one point. if you get one big flood too the number of new seed that's going to come into that and lay back down is just going to be off the charts as well so you know i think it kind of is what it is and i mean you that stuff's going to stay standing you know until you get some heavy frost, I would assume, uh, then it's going to start laying back. But I mean, it was six foot tall. In fact, we uh, we also found a, a it hornet's feels like nest. Like a gladiator field dunner. Oh yeah, we, we found a hornet's nest. I, we were standing there, and I was like, I was like, "Hey, is this a hornet's nest?" About the time I said that, you see him start crawling out. Then <laughs> he <It> just <laughs> oh, <he> took off. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, don't uh, Bro, scatter. If you decide to buy that property, it's awesome. Just leave the bottom alone. That, that's a special farm. Oh, dude, it is know, so thick, so thick. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes they look awesome, but they're you know you, they're right next door to an outfitter or whatever. Yep. Sometimes they don't look awesome, but that farm's kind of like you can. There's high odds that you're going to have mature deer there because it is a place like Bomar was talking about where it. I have not met any serious hunters yet. That well, I, the there I met a couple guys. I don't know how serious, but there's not a lot of guys are serious. Yeah. yeah. And you sold the, you sold the East piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. So to a serious, to a serious guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. The, to your point about the outfitter, there was a, a piece in McCoupin that we were watching. It was like an 80 acre track, perfect access, no road frontage. Uh, everything seemed great about everything it. seemed great about it, you know, and then we actually put a bid on it. It's an, it was a, it's an it's live right now. It's an auction. Um, and so we put a first bid at two thousand dollars an acre just to get the get the ball rolling, see see who would you know jump on it. And then at some point we called. It's part of a Boy Scout camp, and I called the director of a Boy Scout camp and asked. I assumed like, hey, look, this doesn't get hunted. This is purely you know recreational activities of the Boy Scout camp. And he's like, eh, well, you know, actually we we lease it to an outfitter, have for <laughs> five six years. And I, I asked to name the outfitter, look it up, and there's all your two and three year olds. You know, everybody's gri- gripping granite, and we're like, yeah, we're we're out. We're out. We're, 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 <laughs> We're out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I've got a lot of friends that are outfitters. I don't have anything. Oh, them, sure. But, you know, but their goals are different. Yeah. Than, it's know, a business. Uh, uh, They're running a business, yeah. you know? And I mean, yeah. so you can't blame them on that stuff. It's just, well, it may not be their goals. There's nothing wrong with outfitting. It's the goals of the clients and they're coming from all over the place. And it's yeah. Guys shooting a three-year-old 140 inch deer, maybe the biggest deer he ever kills in his life. Yeah. We have a hard enough time controlling that, like on our home farm in, <laughs> in Ohio and they're not paying us anything. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's tough to see how that all kind of comes together. With it, that that Shelby the farm that you have though, the nice thing about it was when we were driving back there, we're like, dude, we feel remote, right? Oh, yeah. And that's just that's always one of those check boxes I have in the Midwest. Like, it's not that you can't kill. You know, we've seen giant bucks in Kansas right next to towns, but when you get out there and you feel remote. That's I mean, one of my favorite a big, things. A big buck loves that, too. It's hard to find, man. We feel that in Kansas. Like, yeah. when you're out there, you're like, nobody's been standing in a spot in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're looking for. Yeah, Kansas is so different. From, I mean, it's just so – everything's different. You know, Iowa – here's another thing. Like, if you're going to put together a portfolio and stuff, you got to have a little piece in Iowa. I, if it's 10 acres, if it's 20 acres, if it's 50, 80, whatever, it is the greatest thing – to get in a rotation of, you know, you can draw in zone six, probably three out of four years or something like that. If you've got a family member, they can, they can apply. Somebody can always be drawing, you know, there's party hunting yep. um, with your family members. Like if one person draws, there's a, there's a, a game and a system to play where you can hunt your farm every year, late season. The phenomenon is talking about having a plan. Illinois generally will take longer, more sits to kill a target deer in general. But if you have a late season setup up there, it's a one spot, one blind, perfect ingress and egress, maybe two blinds. So you can hunt it every day, no matter what, and not pressure your farm. It's two weeks long. You can also bow hunt on it. And the phenomenon is you can run a feeder on it during deer season. You just can't hunt over the feeder. And there's, there's some real laws there. You have, yes, you can have the feeder on there the whole season when everybody else removes it because they can't hunt over it. And you can hold deer in there with a feeder and then move it and just clean up the whole site. And, you know, if you're worried about it, tell the game warden what you've done and are we good to hunt. But 
so you can hold deer there wow. when everybody else is hunting. Well, that's what, uh... and then you have a, a late season food food source and the phenomenon is your farm has had zero pressure yeah so like when we all feel the late the kind of the post deer season blues it's like winding down and we're like uh it's over all of a sudden you have christmas and then you got a second deer season which is so easy you just go up there get a heater get in your blind and <laughs> just watch deer like pour out and in a 10-year period i argue that you know if you if you have a thousand acres here and an uh 80 there you will probably kill as many or more big deer on your wall on that 80 hunting late season than you will over here sure. on much more ground hunting way more time. It's, hmm. it's a no brainer. It's a, it's it a is no a brainer. wild phenomenon. It's not just Iowa. It's, it's anywhere during that late season. It's like, it's a different animal at that point, but it's like 95% of people have been like ready to throw in the towel. I'm usually one of them. Uh, and unless, but if you've put in the work to set something up like that, it's like, there they are. Like there's that deer I was hunting the whole rut here. Of course, he's coming to the only food sauce, uh, food source that's here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of bizarre. Yeah. I may or may not have several bean fields uh, scattered across. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but in and, and talking like vision board stuff, if you want an end game strategy, you would have a, a piece in Kansas. Again, doesn't have to be crazy big, just a piece in Kansas a small it just has to be it doesn't have to be huge because whether it's 40 or 80 or 120 well, you, you want basically an, get you want an 80 in kansas right so you can hunt it every year that, that'd be the bench part. Gonna, yeah and i'm talking iowa so like regardless how or anywhere regard especially iowa late season if you have a piece you're sampling whether it's 40 to 150 acres you're still sampling basically the same amount of acres sure. here. you have that for late season if you have something in Kansas on your vision board, you've got that for early season, September. which is yep. equally is freaking unbelievable hunting. And then that clears your plate to hunt, you know, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri in the, in the rest of the year where it's going to take longer. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're stacking odds, you know, in your favor. And, and a thing that I'm big on is like, I don't hunt two deer at the same time generally i don't bounce back when i get on one i'm like you're laser focused mm -hmm. laser focused mm -hmm. when you start bebopping around your probability goes yeah we've seen that the, you know we'll, we leave we leave well and part of it's because of our dads and in, in time but like third week in november if we draw kansas we're in kansas which means we let the gas off of our other farms and normally when we're in Kansas, it's like, yeah, there, oh, there mean, he is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a combination of strategies, depending on like where we're at. It's, you know, it's kind of like the multiple small parcels over one big parcel strategy applied to deer. Like in Ohio, dude, I have such a hard time getting deer, even to four years old, especially five years old. So like I've, I've just been, honestly, it's a hundred percent of the time, like basically that I've got invested into a certain deer and it's like, they, they get killed. And and we don't need to go down this rabbit hole in today's conversation, but it's because Ohio is a bait state. Um, and you know, those five acre parcels hunt better than your thousand acre parcel, you know, just with enough corn on it basically is how it works. But right. Crazy man. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that portfolio thing. Cause I mean, we've had the conversation a little bit around Iowa and, and, you know, oh, it's on the radar. We're going next year for yeah. Our, we'll our first we'll time. draw we'll draw in one of the you know zone fives or something next year with five points. But it, it's always been on the radar from a portfolio. But the the mindset has been well, why would I buy there if I can only hunt every five years with my bow or whatever? But to your point, Bobby, there's there's a, there there's more. a cycle around it. Not during October or November, but in the late season. Sure. So you can, you can bow hunt on that late season tag. Right. Yeah, which would be awesome. And and you so, knew that, right? Did you? Yeah, I just I don't I'm not as familiar with the points and how it all works for yeah. that. Yeah. I've I've gone from planning like big because in Iowa a lot of areas you need to plant like a large field in order for it to make it right. So I've gone to doing double fence or double rows of electric fence, doing smaller acreage. Yeah. Mm. Um, just it's just easier to manage. It's cheaper. Blah blah blah. And, uh, but you can literally, when you take the electric fence down, you can create pinch points. When yeah. You bow hunt. Yeah. So Crazy. it's like, yeah. Um, uh, man, I, uh, yeah, I was cool. 
And it doesn't Iowa. seem like, uh, I mean, obviously in some of those like big tillable counties and stuff, price per acre is expensive, but we've seen some wreck ground. We watched some auctions go off. I mean, it, it wasn't that bad from a price per acre standpoint. Yeah, it's rising. You know, basically in most of the Midwest, in my opinion, people are willing to pay in the 6,000, six to 6,500 for big deer. So that started, in my opinion, with Pike County. It was the first one to be commercialized. It was the first one that shot the 6,500. Then you watch the same thing happen in Decatur County because it was yep. it was well known because of the juries and all these people that were there. And so with social media and everything, people have basically realized that there's big deer everywhere. So these pockets, they, they get hot because of whatever reason, and then they rise. So like, in my opinion, if you're in an, and that goes back to, you know, seeing value where other people don't see it. Like I bought stuff undervalued or at market value, knowing we're going to change the market Yeah, because mm -hmm. 100% because it's worth, it is, we know what people are willing to pay for big deer. If they're coming from wherever they don't like, they don't, it, this doesn't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. They don't know the market. They yeah. just know what they're willing to pay for big deer. Sure. So like Us. we have literally <laughs> personally, tell me what I want to hear. Literally, well, we've literally changed markets like a dozen times. Yeah. Where we bought stuff and, and, and sometimes we'll do it with a lot of, with several farms and we'll kind of ladder the market up. We'll sell the sure. first one for three. Yeah. You become your own days. comparable. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely have, made made it some of our own markets but that's where i'm talking about understanding and being confident in markets and yeah. knowing what people will pay even though the market right now like for another example like there was a trough between van buren county and decatur county iowa which is like between lakoskis and juries essentially like a big hammock and that stuff you know a few uh what is it maybe three winters ago we looked at a farm it was like 3100 an acre Ooh. we didn't buy it because we like Something's got to be wrong. This is too cheap. Yeah. So we didn't buy it. And then the next year, somebody bought it and it came back on the market for like 42 and we bought it. <laughs> and then we also bought like two other farms in the area. And by the time we got done kind of laddering, we had, the market was at 6,000. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, so and I don't see it. That I don't see it going down, man. I, I don't, I, you know, maybe we're not going to see these giant jumps that we saw post COVID, right. You know, in 2021, 22, even, but I, not go. it's not going down. Mm -mm. It's not going to. I mean, people are gonna. Uh, people listen to this, myself included. Like I'm, I'm willing to buy the right land because I know where it's going in the market. Right? Maybe it, maybe it's not gonna jump two thousand dollars an acre, but surely in a year or two it could jump five hundred bucks an acre, seven fifty an acre, especially if I make improvements to it. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a tough thing for people to comprehend. But I, again, and it's so funny we say it, but it's so true. It's like, dude, you can sit there and talk about it a lot. But if you don't get in the game. We have. We've sat here and talked about it a lot. If you don't get in the game, <laughs> two years from now, you're going to be saying, holy shit, it's seven an acre or 7,500 an acre. Yeah. And there's comps up there right now. There's stuff selling. I mean, it's crazy. Well, you have to ask yourself. I mean, if you're if you're coming, and maybe it's different if you're in the Midwest, but not that much different. But if you're coming from the South or you're coming from the East or Michigan or wherever, and somebody says, hey, this 80 acres, I can't guarantee you because I don't control it. But every year, there's a, there's a grow spooner on it. Every year. What's that worth to you from where you're coming from where you can't even grow a, a, a 125? Right. I mean, it, well, what it's is, big. What is... What is what is rec ground cost in Ohio where you guys hunt? Well, I just told Jared, I said the rec ground in Ohio is as much it as it is in, in Western Illinois. Well, right what's now. it going for down in Megs? That's like southeastern. Oh, we just started jumping. I mean, I bought my farm at like high twos, and it's now you can't find anything under four in but a that's year. That's down south. You get that's up a, ours there has been, I mean, East Central. Ours, ours is 5,500 to seven. Has been. That was yeah. a couple of years ago. Stuff was going for fifty five hundred to seven is what I'm seeing in in central. In those Amish areas, they're really driving prices up. Yeah, I thought some of that stuff was going in the tens and around around Columbus and north of Columbus. Yeah, yeah, licking, yeah, yep. licking like Muskegum. Yep, fifty five hundred, seventy five hundred. I mean, there's some in, in Muskegum right now going for What's between going, eight what, and eleven. What about Ben's like the Shockton areas? That's sixty five hundred an acre. More seventy five hundred to nine. 
Wow. Right. So that that's the market I was kind of getting to. I mean, people are paying that much money for deer hunting ground. And, yeah. Over the you counter. Know. You know, it, it's a, and, it's an easy jump for it, me from it Pennsylvania is, or, or, or Amish, Michigan. Dude, I'm telling you, like they got that group buying power thing going for them. They're, yeah, they're leveraging they're it. They're spending big money on properties. Yeah. And and I'll, and and here's the aspect uh, that people you really need to wrap your head around the tillable market. Yeah. So many of these farms have come out have tillable on them. That market is literally the best place to put money in the oh, world dude. right now. It's unbelievable. I mean, literally, you know, China's pouring money into it. The, Bill Gates is pouring money into it, and that's it's we, a the hard. Hunters, stand against and buy it up <laughs> yeah it's a hard that's a hard thing for people to because we're wreck minded right we think woods we think brushy and stuff if you've got a farm of which a lot of those farms in in western illinois and iowa have tillable on it i mean guys are paying 12 13 15 an acre for like high quality tillable ground well talk about diversifying right. your property too i mean we're obviously looking for that brushy the you know the thick awesome deer hunting stuff but wouldn't you also want to sure up that investment by you know, buying something with tillable on it, maybe buying if, if it's got some sort of house or structure, like those other elements of yeah, value, CRP. maybe even if they're non non hunting values, you yeah. know, those are big. Well, that, that's the investment <clears throat> side of it. Right. I mean, right. most people, unless you're just looking for, I've got money and I want a hunting ground. Most people want it also to be a smart investment. Right. And it, it is like to your point, Bobby, like if it's good hunting ground, like you're going to be able to resell it for probably more than you bought it for. Um, yeah. but the funny it, part is even those guys that are just like, I'm just buying hunting, they're still making money doing it. Absolutely. That's how good the market is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you do a little bit of work to it. You, you set it up a little bit better. You kill I'm, a 200 inch off you of kill, it. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest though. You just get a picture of a 200 inch deer. You don't yeah. have to even kill the freaking thing. Right. I mean, you get a picture of a 200 inch deer on the property. Good as gold. Yeah. Could have been one time. Doesn't matter. Call me. I may know somebody interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just that's how it is. So I I think that um, sure if it can be have some uh, income producing capability, uh, a timber I think is a huge undervalue. But but tillable timber energy. CRP energy is a big one. Energy oh. the wind farms, the solar panel potential, yeah. the oil and gas around here is obviously huge. A lot of times it's it's unknown. It's harder to like yeah to have the foresight on that, but. So I'll give the, I'll give you guys and the listeners a secret weapon. Okay. Okay. There's there's a company called Common Ground. Okay, and they're kind of like a Zillow for the rec and hunting space. Um, they have a back office suite of tools for realtors and stuff to use. It's basically a marketplace. Well, they originally started as CashRent.com, which is merged into Common Ground. But one of their most powerful tools is basically an online auction platform to lease your tillable. So when I buy a farm. As soon as I buy it, I'll generally make the seller terminate the farmer or I'll terminate him. And when I terminate him, because there's a lot of like emotional, like sure. you feel bad and this yeah. and that. So I'll say, look, I'm sending you a termination letter, but just know it doesn't mean you can't farm it again. I just need a clean slate and I need to figure out what the market value is. People don't know what the market value of no idea is right now. There is a large in the in the in the real in the uh, stock market stuff. You have a bid ask spread. There is a huge bid ask spread in tillable leasing. So in general, people lump it to one hundred and fifty or two hundred an acre. That's what it used to be. Every one of my farms, I put on the cashrent.com and I put it out for auction. And you want to talk about building some value? I had a farm that was getting two hundred and fifty an acre. I went around to some local farmers and tried to get somebody to give me an offer. Oh, I don't want to step on such and such toes. And well, I give you 270 and I give you 280, but I, you know, well, can I have some numbers? Well, I don't really know anybody. And I'm like, okay. So I put it on cash rent. I got 481 an acre. Holy jeez. So what does that do to your, your value of your property? I had another one that was at 200 an acre. It went to 400 an acre. I had another one that was at 200. It went to 281. Where are those kind of another from, Bobby? One. Like, is that, I, that's on the common ground side. I know, I know. But it's so, like, what's the geographic location of the people who end up? Ev everywhere. So here, and here's how it works. They take the listing and then they market it. They have a list of producers and stuff from the FSA and they market it to that local base mm -hmm. as well as you know, a larger base, you know, of investors and stuff around the country. But what's cool about their, their model and their platform is they're, 
they're opening it up to like uh, they're building white label sites so other real estate companies can use their platform. Yeah. So, so for example, the Whitetail Group. If you go on my page, you can go to you know le- farm lease your farmland, and I have a white label site. And essentially, you can you can go through Whitetail Group's platform to to lease your farm, put it out for auction. You still get all the same benefits as if you list yeah. it straight through them. The difference is if you do it through our platform, I can help you essentially with our farm lease that we've tailored over the years i can help you negotiate your crops you know and and how they're bought back you know so that it's as cheap as possible in other words you're you're only paying input costs you're not they're not you're not paying what their profit would have been you know lots of rights in there you know the right to you know overseed uh they can't chisel plow until after the season without your uh written permission to put all your food in sometimes you want it chisel plowed yeah uh the right to maintain edges there's just like lots of things and you can get that farmer because i got quite a bit of stuff scattered everywhere and i rely on my farming contract to manage a lot of this like a lot of my bean fields and stuff i don't have to go to i try and get a lot of these farms set to where i don't have to go there because the farmer's done something for me Hmm. um that platform is extremely powerful uh there was another one my fulton farm was at uh, my, um, I got a farm right now. It's at 150. It should be at 375. My Fulton farm was at 200. It went to 371. Wow. And we're talking a lot of this soil is 119 pi. It's Class B stuff. And and when you are almost doubling your your rent, that's income, crazy, man. That has an instant massive. So anyway, all that being said, if you're looking to unlock some some, and and it's crazy because I'll tell people and they'll be like, ah, well. You know, I like my farmer and I get that. Yeah. I like a lot of my, I love, I have so many farmer friends, but at the same time, like this is a business decision and they still have the ability to rent it, but yeah. they have to rent it for, for market value. Yeah, market. And right now without, without an auction platform, it's really hard to know. Yeah. To what get that source of prices. Value. How, uh, how does common ground make money? Do they take a commission on those transactions or? Yep. It's, it's a 4% c- commission. And like, if you do it through whitetail group site, it's also 4%, but you want to talk about, a good investment. Yeah. Four percent. A hundred percent. To get, yeah, it's yeah, to, awesome. To, to double yeah, your, so. to double your cash rent to pay 4%. Yeah. That's nothing. Um, yeah. I assume does it like in terms of, uh, ordering that process, like, do you have to, can you just put it up for bid and like, see what you get? Or like, do you have to break it to your farmer first? Like how, if people are like, well, I have what? a farmer. No, you have to terminate your farmer and it then needs to be open. it's like eBay put it out there to bid. You know, yeah. he doesn't even have to be terminated. Tech, he just has to be terminated by the time that it, the new lease. Is there even starts. a remote risk that like I fire my farmer, I put it on common ground and then nobody else wants it. And then the guys, like, I mean, not, the guy's like, all right, now I'll today's. give you half what I was giving you or whatever. Not in today's. I mean, you got to kind of know what you're doing, but not really in today's in today's world. You know, and the other cool thing about the platform, like it's every producer has a um, has like a profile. So you can, when, when the bids close, you know, you can, you can look through everybody's profile, how many acres they farm, how long they farm, farming practices, blah, 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 blah. And then you can actually call them and have a conversation. Like I've called where the high bidder won't answer his phone. I'm like, you're out. And then Mm. I'll, you know, and then I'll get to a guy that's like, just, yeah, this is the guy. And so you don't have to accept the high bid. You don't have to, you're not forced into it. Yeah. I guess the root of my question is like, we're not in, you know, Illinois, like it's, it's not like a, a predominantly farming area. It's like there's there's pasture and there is farming that happens. It just doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of farmers. Like it's a pretty it's a limited supply. So like I would be fearful that we'd fire our guy, and then like it's it's him and two other guys that are even would want to farm our place. You know. Well, I can I, you know obviously I can't speak to that, but uh, you're speaking to like Western uh, Illinois and Iowa t- areas and. Yeah. We're tillables in super high demand. Like there is high competition. Yeah. The only way we yeah. knew, or like, I guess how feel okay about So in our farm in Eastern central Ohio, you're going to laugh because it's not even close to what you get, but we get $75 an acre. Uh, and they farm about right. 300 of it. And basically the way we checked that out was I, I called like the, the farm office, like the, whatever the NRCS and said, Hey, here's kind of what this guy's offering us per acre. What do you think? And he's like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's the way it is, but it takes a while sometimes for the markets to, 
there's so much moving, you know, it's like commodities prices shot up, but then input costs shot up and it's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy. And then there's, there's another company very similar to them. I think it's called, <clears throat> I think it's Landgate. And yeah, you can I've do heard the same Landgate thing before. Similar. We know Landgate. Yeah. yeah. We know yeah, so you can do the same yeah. thing. You put your farm on there and it'll tell you like, it'll give you an, and the other thing on common ground is the cash estimate tool. You can literally put your field in. It gives you this beautiful breakdown of the PI and the soil types and the estimated cash rent. And the est- I mean, it's just like a heck of a tool when you're out there looking at stuff to just wow. get a good idea of what the heck is, is what, you know, yeah. cause that's something you need to know as an investor. You need to know your revenue. Absolutely, crazy. man. For sure. Yeah. And I can, I can, I can help you with that. Cause we, we do, we do, so, uh, like I said, I mean, you're getting the same exact package if you do it through our site. It's just, you know, yeah. we can help you tailor so that. Where are they going? Are they just contacting you through the site, Bobby? Or is there a certain section on that site to, to go through that step? There's a section and, and there's a link that clicks over to basically our, our white label, you know, white group page of common ground. But I could, you know, if, if somebody's interested, in, they, they can email me and I can help. Them we'll try the it. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. S- since we're kind of on the subject, Bobby, how do you feel about uh, CRP programs? Um. <laughs> so I, I we we recommend them a lot in our plans to take food off the table. Yep. So a lot of our plans, we're taking big ag fields, and we're we're trying to take the plates off the table, our die hard stuff. And we're yep. building big plots in one spot with perfect ingress and egress. We have a big standing grain field and a smaller green to grain pinch transfer in front of a blind that's generally brushed into switch grass. So you have perfect egress and the, and the blind sits low. We use our corn boxes, which have jack stands. So you yep. can move them out and, yep. and they're set free and you're just in the game. That's, the that's the ultimate way to set farms up um that being said if somebody has a bunch of tillable and we're basically recommending they get rid of it i get it put it into crp and then you still get income sometimes as high as the cash rents my only thing with the crp is a lot of the it's a tool everything's a tool it works in certain situations so a lot of the programs don't have they're not switch heavy, you know, like the best programs are going to be big blue and Indian stuff. And that's great. It looks great. It's a little harder plant, a little harder to manage. Um, it doesn't rebound in snow. What I do is I recommend you plant like a 20 or 30 foot strip. When you enroll it in CRP, you obviously don't leave your, have your food in it. And then you, and then you include 20 foot of or 20 or 30 foot strip that's also not in crp and you do solid switch and that way against your plot where you're trying to have your screen or your ingress and egress it is switch yeah and then the rest you can put in the crp because at that point you're just using it as a tool to take plates off the table you know so it works you know my biggest kind of gripes about crp programs it's just they're they don't there's just not a lot of like follow up and education. So like they don't like teach people or incentivize people to manage it and burn it and stuff. At least I know I was a lot better, but at least here in Illinois. So like so much of the CRP, like it's just a kind of a joke, like it gets planted and then people don't take care of it and it turns into a weed field. that does absolutely. Right. Nothing. Right. Um, I really wish that the, you know, the government would, would realize that like we as hunters are like, um, and I'm, I'm talking out of my expertise. I'm not a biologist, but you're going to have a lot of weed fields that are doing nothing because people are not managing them. And us as hunters is the largest group that is going to manage them. It'd be nice if they could have a switch heavy mix. I know switch will take all over or even a monoculture of switch. That they would allow, you know, certain percentage of the farm because planter hunters would plant the crap out of that. It's easy to manage and they would manage it really good. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Well, cause I mean, you know, the ultimate thing around CRP besides the, the, you know, cash income that can come in from it is we want good habitat embedding. I mean, that's why we're planning it, right? We're taking that food off the table. We want the deer to use and, and benefit from whatever is in CRP. Yep. And it's, you know, if it's a big weed field, they're not getting the maximum benefit of it. Now, some people do manage it and take care of it. It looks awesome. Um, mm-hmm. 
but just in general, a lot of the CRP just kind of. Well, it's because it's a long term. I mean, I mean after, do, does the first it, five to seven years are usually really good, and then if you don't manage it after that, you know. I mean, do, does it work that way? Can it work that way? Like, if you know, if you buy a farm and it's got half of it's in a CRP program, like, can you expect that half of it to be good habitat? That they're betting in that. Like, does I assume it depends on how it's being managed, or what yeah. was planted originally. Yeah. And they, you know, obviously they'll, they bet like crazy in those big blue and Indian grass fields and stuff. It's just a lot of them don't make it to that point because there's so little, you know, education and, 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 you know, they try and make people do it, but I don't know. It just, you don't see too many really nice warm season grass fields in Illinois, but I feel like if it was solid switch, you'd see better ones because more guys that care about managing them would take care of them. And they're easier to manage because you it's way easier to plant because you can frost seed it. You can seed it out of a hand seeder. It's, you know, it, you can spray 2,4-D on it. It's just easier to manage it. It rebounds it, you know. So mm-hmm. I got all my levees here on my pond. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, and I'm sure, you know, you can call whoever, you know, NRCS or whatever and say, hey, listen, I've, I've got this farm. It, you know, it's enrolled in CRP. And it doesn't look like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. What can I do to make it better within the bounds of the program? Of, and I'll tell you, like our local uh, NRCS office here, um, like those guys are, if you're willing to go and, and work and do stuff, like they're all about work, you know, flex, working with you, flexibility. I mean, they're, they seem to be just happy that somebody's wanting to, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. to manage it, to do better with it. Yeah. 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 And what's funny about the switch is like very rarely are we rec- using it as a betting tool. It's almost always a take Screen. the plates off the table and, 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 and access. Ingress, yeah. egress. You know, it takes a, it takes a big field, you know, to have deer bed in, in, in solid switch. Like, takes a pretty big field usually from what I've seen. I saw we feel about it. I mean, we talked to, you know, it's a little different out here, I guess, like in the Northeast, but like a, a lot of guys feel like they won't bed in a monoculture of, of switch just because there is no food in it. They're like, you know, you talk about a weed field. It almost seems like that's what you would want. As long as it has enough structure to stay adequate height, oh, you know, yeah. the fact that it's got food is, yeah, go ahead. It's, and depending on what you're trying to do, it's like the glass half full you know, you might want it to be a, a short weed field. You might want part of it to be a short weed field. Mark does a lot of recommendations with switch on our consults using that natural edge, you know, as as a funnel to a stand, you know, when they're cruising, you know. Um, so it's like farming. You know, sometimes you want every ounce of food not chisel plowed, and other times you want it all chisel plowed to put them into your food. So mm. just it's all it's all a tool and it's all what you're trying to do and 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 you know perspective hmm. and those come in uh i, I know you, you might not be the expert on crp I'm, I'm just rattling off questions here do those come in like 10 and 15 year programs or longer there's different contract re- time periods there's different you know there's different programs with different prices depends on you know how erodible your land is with the slope you know there's different programs for more slope less slope there's quails buffer you know there's buffer strips there's quail programs there's butterfly there's all kinds of stuff yeah you know so it is you know i'm not i'm not like i don't do a whole lot with enrolling i do more with unenrolling like my missouri farm that i've got on my site there i actually just bought out an acre and a half so that i could put food there my pike 80 that i sold we actually bought out of the program some acreage for food. Okay. Um, What's that look that, like from a cost standpoint to do do something like that? If you catch it early enough, it, it it's it, it can be okay. Like Pike had just enrolled yep. recently, and it cost me like eight hundred dollars to take it out. Missouri probably cost me about fifteen or two, but a small acreage. So mm-hmm. they 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 make you back pay and you pay a penalty. Um, but you know, it's in the big picture, it's it's uh so but if it's early like you're saying it's the amounts less because yeah. they've paid you less yeah versus being in it for 10 years and then trying to back pay your way out of it yeah not that would not be that would be painful yeah interesting hmm. cool man 
Well, listen, dude, yep. we've, uh, we appreciate you coming on and talking to about us, uh, with, you know, everything you guys have going on. I mean, Jared and I have followed the whitetail group here for, for quite a while now and what you guys are doing. And it's, and it's freaking awesome. I mean, I, I know I'm on the, the, <laughs> the early buyer list. So anytime something comes up, I'm like, you know, on edge of what, what's going to happen. But, um, I would encourage anyone look, you know, looking for land in, in that area, the Midwest, um, to go on your site and sign up, you know, can't hurt, right? If something comes across just to be able to look at it. Cause I know that you guys have a lot of properties that, you know, the moment, you know, it's going to hit the market. I'm sure people are pouncing on them. Uh, I think yeah. maybe it's an Adams County one, even that Paul Baker that we know was like, Hey, this is coming up. It's near my farm. And I'm like, cool. I'll look at it. I wrote you. And you're like, yeah, pending. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got a huge, a lot of the best farms, they, they come, they come up, well, as soon as they're for sale, there's already like 20 sure. people in line. Yeah. So like we have a, I've built like just a like big network of, of people. Um, and I'm in the timber world. So some of it comes through that, but just like, I have so many feelers that, and it's not just me, it's the team of us, you know, like Lee and Toby and mm -hmm. like all these, we see stuff first. So we get a lot of these farms. And then once we get them, like, I think you mentioned on the Ben rising podcast, like our prices aren't crazy. Like we're no. just selling them market value. They come with a free console, you know, that consult video lives on. So if you take that in the future to sell it, you, you can hand that over to the next person. Like there's value in having the brand having touched it and we're just selling stuff at, at market value. We have to, we have to, we're in the game and we have to see hidden value on the front end. We're not selling stuff for way over market value, yep. but it gives you like, if you get on our pre-market list, it gives you the ability to like see stuff before, you know, everybody else and, and possibly tap into our network to see some of these farms, you know, before they're gobbled up pre-market anyway, you know? Well, and for guys like Jared and I, I mean, we, we are in no means afraid of doing the work. In fact, we love that off season aspect, but the fact that we're in Pennsylvania and those, a lot of those farms are in Illinois, it's, it's a it's, distance challenge. Yeah, yeah. The cost effectiveness of us carting all our equipment out there to do all the stuff versus saying, Hey, Bobby, per the plan you have laid out, it's whatever, 230 bucks extra per acre. You'll wrap it up in the financing. Get me those plots in there, put them in, yeah. you know? And then a lot of times, like if we're doing a logging project, we'll bring the person that's buying it in and we'll tailor the farm to the logging project. Like we build like kill thicket type things like you know, perfect access to a certain tree on the downwind side of a little south facing point that we open up and make a thicket so that they got to use their nose to check it because they can't see it. But that puts them right in front of the stand. So like there's a lot of things that we're doing in the logging project and involving the landowners in so that we're literally that's like the foundation part. Like that's a good thing that that is the rough end. That's when the, the foundation is laid for the farm. It's not like, oh, can we put a food plot over? We can put one over here because it's there's an open spot. It's where do we want the deer to bed? Ha, you know where, and we start building these these little mouse traps and stuff. So it's fun <laughs> because people want to do that. That's most people want to be involved as much as they want to shoot big deer. They want to build something. They don't have the means and the equipment and stuff, so they'll do it alongside of us a lot of times and let us do the heavy lifting with the you know with the equipment. And, and a lot of times they're getting a farm at market value. And they're getting it all set up and developed. And it's only because the timber value allows us yep. to go in there and do that for them. Otherwise, it would add $800 an acre, yeah. $1,000 an acre. Yeah, somebody's got to get that cost. And basically, you're using the the kind of recognized value when you bought it to offset that. Yeah. Yep. So we'll, we'll have to do another podcast and go deep dive off in the timber world, which would be fun. And oh, then, yeah, man. One where we, it might be like a five-part thing where we deep dive into hunting uh deer strategy let's do it we've, we've done a lot of timber stuff here recently we had the the forestry consultant that uh helped jeremy he recently took a bunch yep. of timber off of in his ohio. ohio place we had ben on who obviously you know we kind of default to a timber conversation there at some point but yeah you're absolutely welcome well and to come that on and, that and midwest that. timber is dude, a different world you know because like you know I, the I, mist midwest period is a different world dude yeah. it's this whole time we're talking about like the screen to grain thing is is really interesting like you talk about that that is how you set them up that's mm -hmm. dude that's a midwestern thing like you know to look at our farms in ohio and stuff and it's like that the the way the fields are shaped you know or even going to southern illinois where it gets real blocky and like 
it, it seems very unique to like Iowa, that that Northwestern, uh, Illinois, Northern Missouri. Like that's where those fields, the tillable pieces are are coved back in there. Like that's where that exists. Yeah. Or and, you have to create it, like Bobby said. And like, you know, on that yeah. Shelby piece, you guys kind of carve that green field in to come out to that three acre bean field or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you like so one of our 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 maiden, you know, projects was our Cass County project. It's a, it was a 700 acre piece and it was literally one of the like most overthought out, overdeveloped, like hunting things ever. And you can still go back in our video stuff and watch the development of that farm. It was completely raw. We cleared like 50 acres of standing timber. And we made wall systems and openings, but it was all laid out over where the deer were naturally using the terrain and the huntable trees. Literally shot our target deer two years in a row, first sit coming out of a gap that we made. Like it was ridiculous. Mm. And that is a situation like where you could take a blank timber farm in Ohio. And if there's timber as a vehicle, we could go in and we could literally draw that thing like a blueprint and, and build it. I'm kind of, you know, to, to a point, you know, working through my timber consultant and, and the uh, the logging company, you know, I've got three, you know, strategic four and two acre clear cuts going in for bedding and I've got strategic t trails coming out and I've got a lot of, I've got 300,000 board feet of timber coming off that place too. I mean, it's, it was substantial amounts of timber that automatically is going to create better habitat too coming off. So yeah, it, it, it's uh, that timber piece. I think people, uh, People get gun shy. It, it, we talked about this with Madison. It goes one way or the other. They they have uh, timber that they think is worth way more than it actually is. Or in my case, I, I was kind of naive to how much timber and value was there to where I was like, I know it was good enough that I invested in it, but I had no idea what the return was going to be. And it was substantial. So um, it can be crazy. Yeah, it can be absolutely crazy. And the markets change. And yeah. You got to have a somewhat of a savvy, you know, you got to make sure you got somebody in your court that's that is paying attention to the markets and selling it right. And so you guys have somebody internally now for that. Uh, yeah. So basically the last several years, like my literally building the logging company division up has been it has it has sucked the life out of me. I mean, it yeah. was taking so much of my time and uh who's now my good buddy, Alex Carr. He uh, went to Carbondale for forestry and yep. uh, he, it, it was about a three month training process here uh, when he came on board, you know, last winter, but man, you want to talk about sharp and, and he has literally, I, I, I joke with my wife and I say like, I feel like I retired because he has taken so much off yeah. of my plate. that allows me to get back out and doing some of this other stuff. But, but, even even though he went to forestry school and again back to the the group mentality like i'm not a forester um i you know i i meet with landowners i figure out what their goals are and then we try and do the cut to meet those goals mm -hmm. and so now we have a forester in-house who who can make sure he blends a forestry aspect it's a complicated thing because they're you know depending on what your goal, our goals as a hunter for a timber project are completely different than like a state forester. Yeah, completely. absolutely. And there's got to be a balance. So like yep. when I'm marking timber, I'm not, I can't just go and mark like white oak and walnut. I have to, you know, I have, I can in certain areas, but if I get into areas where there's a bunch of other species, I can't not cut those yeah. because of forestry aspects. So there is a lot to balance and, there's a lot of expectations to meet with landowners, which that's our number one goal um, above money and everything. You know, we're just trying to hit base hit after base hit and, and make everybody happy and, and do our business in volume. And we like this winter, I think that at one point we had like 11 crews going around Illinois and Iowa. Um, so, you know, just trying to do a good job and, and meet people's, you know, uh, expectations i think you guys are good luck for everybody who owns farms in oh, illinois oh there comes the rain baby yeah you we got might, you guys we might needed it dude. Some, some water it was it was dry out there <laughs> i mean dry the rain dance. we bought go. the ranch in kansas and everybody's going on about how it's been a drought for three years and 
you know, I did my rain dance and, and it's she... rain nonstop there. Oh, <laughs> gotta love it, man. Ain't nothing better this time of year. Ours is coming it. this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, Bobby, I mean, we'll, 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 you can see the lighting changing. I know that's man. it right there. That one's going to hit us here in a couple of days. I hope. <laughs> Well, we'll uh, we'll for sure rope you back in. We've got lots of things to talk about. We appreciate you coming on, man. It, it's been a long time coming. You know, I'm glad Rising hooked us up, and um, it, I, well, you know, just because we know it. If anybody's listening, I will call Bobby on that that uh, Shelby 85. Uh, it is a banging big buck farm, and it sets up so well. Um, so if you're looking, you know, and it's it's reasonably priced too. There's a potential. Uh, 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 next year potential uh additional lease next door so yeah it's a it's a really really cool piece and um but yeah man we appreciate you coming on and uh look forward to having you back thank you guys all right buddy everybody talk soon and awesome sir really cool i mean so uh you know we didn't really get into it but sounds like bobby toby lee you know as kind of that core team obviously he's got the new forester on board you know you integrate guys like um mark luster and ben rising into these these pieces um this this new kansas piece they have a big ag guy involved there uh, we looked at that the it's other like a day. five thousand acre track giant giant <laughs> yeah, track huge. yeah and so um but you know good to hear a guy like bobby who's like yep yeah, you know I, I took a risk i got this 20 you know i did some things to it got a few pictures of a big deer and uh, like a single property set him in motion to do what he's doing. Dude, have you met any guys that have invested in recreational properties that are like, I wish I wouldn't have done that? No. Never? No. Mm-mm. Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, you can't, we talk about this all the time, you can't out- outpunt your coverage, right? You can't go in and buy, you know, a, a property that you can't afford. Um, you know, we've done the math on several of these. It, the The 20% is the big hit. Right. In most mm-hmm. cases from fine. I mean, that that could be a large number. Um, but when you get into the monthlies, especially when you have tillable or you've got CRP or you've got anything that's income producing, it can offset that stuff. Your, your monthly mortgage, even at a six or seven percent interest rate pretty quickly. Um, now, nobody wants to pay interest. Right. But the, the, the thing is, is if you've got if you find a great farm and you have to get in it at a six or seven percent interest rate in today's society, you know, 18 or 24 mm-hmm. months from now, we're going to drop. We may not be back into the twos, but we'll be in the fours or maybe high threes. Refinance that thing. Yep. Jump on it. Refinance it. Lock it in and, and ride it out. And if it drops again, you refinance it again. It's not, you're not permanently handcuffed for the next 20 years at a seven or 8% interest rate. It's, you know, you refinance it. And most of these guys, we talked to a couple bankers recently, they've got like four or $500 rate lock programs. You pay four or 500 bucks. They redo the paperwork. You're at the rate lock. You're done. Mm-hmm. No brainer. Yep. We um, talked to a guy the other day with a pretty reasonable rate for a five year arm as well. Yeah. So it's it's just um There's it, money out there. Yeah. I like uh I like Bobby's uh, what do you call it? O- OPM, other people's money. Other people's money. <laughs> well, he's got so so uh that kind of rich dad, poor dad mindset, which is Robert's books, but like it's it's you know, debt is not a bad thing. Debt on credit cards and things like that is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Not a good thing. Um, some would argue even student loan debt, not a great thing. Yeah. Um, if it gets to where you're going, it is obviously debt in terms of like mortgages for big assets, whether it's your business or land or whatever, not a bad thing. It's the tool that allows you to build equity in a valuable asset that's appreciating. All you have to do is if, if I have $500,000 in debt on a farm that's worth seven fifty, I have $250,000 in equity, good mm-hmm. equity. Who cares about the five hundred thousand in debt? Nobody. You shouldn't. Like that. That in itself is the theory of. You talk about all these people who are wealthy in life. Very few of them are wealthy in cash in the bank. Mm-hmm. The it's majority of them are yeah. in assets. Yeah, and that's the smart thing, you know, because cash doesn't do anything. I mean, right now some CDs and stuff are doing well, but normally cash doesn't do anything. It it accrues a very a little amount of return every year. You have to invest it into an asset to see the return. Mm-hmm. And that's what you do with land. It's just, it's attaching yourself to like something bigger, you know, whether it's like uh, just a, a land investment like this, or even like at the biggest scale, your, your Elons and your uh, Bill Gates. It's like th- those guys are attached to massive 
giant revenue producing uh, entities. Yeah, businesses. You know, industry pioneers and stuff. And it's like that's that's what their wealth is. It's a it's a percentage of ownership. It's not like Elon owns you know all of this in cash. Like that's not no, how it works. No, and Elon continues to invest into those businesses because it's a tangible thing. He can do things to make it better. Yeah. As the so asset can grows, land. as the asset grows in value, as do you and your net worth. It's the number one thing, and not everybody's wired like this. But the number one thing that I think you and myself and people like Bobby think of is I can do all the work I want every day, and I cannot affect a stock portfolio price. <laughs> well, dude, here's the reality too: is can't like, do it. E- even me at, at 30 years old, you know, you, you have to question at some point in life. You're like, you know. Y- you know, <laughs> life is short, life right? Is short, and you're man. like, do, do I, you know, in terms of pulling money out of a stock market, for instance, you're like, do I, what, what's more important to me? Do I, o- over this 10 year time, do I want to have made a 30% gain or do I want to take a chance on, you know, maybe a slightly less yeah. gain, you 10, know, for 15 something, or 20%. something that I can enjoy 10 years time will have passed, you know, and now ne- the next time I think about that, I'll be 40. Well, right? next time you think about it, you'll be 50, yep. you know, and that keeps happening. Then you look back on your life and you're like, did I, did I enjoy the investments that I made? And that's the thing is what, what is your end goal? The money in the stock market to make you more money is for what? Like, what are you going to use it for? It's for an end game. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, the, there's a different strategy there. That's the that's end game of retirement, of retirement and celebrate. Or to me, I'm of the mindset of, I want to live life today. I share that opinion. I don't, I, I don't do. want to stress myself to where yeah, retirement yeah. is not possible but I want to live in the moment doing things I enjoy today. And if I can invest at the same time into things like land that allows me to do that, no brainer. It's a no brainer. You know, and so I, I again, I, I think the big emphasis, and you hear it from Bobby, who's been in this a long time, land is not going to go down in price. You can tell yourself that all you want. It's not going to happen. Uh, probably not in, in our lifetime. Um, will it exponentially increase like it has been? No, I don't think so. But I don't think that it's ever going to drop to, to any levels that we've, we've thought of in the past. Um, we'll be talking about this three years from now on another, I bought a farm podcast and land values will be 7,500 an acre versus 6,500 an acre. That's just, it, it's supply and demand. It's not going to change. It's only going to get worse, frankly, the way things are being bought up and the way access from hunting is, is going away, mm. only going to get worse. So the demand is going to increase and the supply is continuing to decrease. I'm really interested to hear it. <clears throat> and I don't know like exactly when this will drop. In really, you may have already heard the podcast, but like literally tonight, we're going to talk to Matt Ranella, mm-hmm. uh, who is, is, I think has a lot of insight on how the hunting industry is driving market values and like what the future of hunting looks like in terms of, of, of access, whether it's for good or bad. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested to hear how, how that kind of complements this conversation with Bobby. Yeah. And I mean, uh, people listening to the Hunter podcast, different than the Abata farm, I, you know, there's a big crossover there, but at the same time, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that hunt because of just the pursuit and, and to be out there and, and challenge. And then there's a different group of people around land ownership and management of wildlife. And, you know, the same people who hunt just for the pursuit will say, well, that's deer farming. Maybe. Um, I enjoy creating habitat and growing bucks almost as much as I do hunting them uh, in, well, in today's, in, in my lifetime, at least right it's now. It's almost just like adapting to the reality. Like there's, it seems like there's a group of people who are like, oh, well, hunting's for the rich and it's, it's this and that. And like a lot of that we can kind of agree so, with. It'd be trending in that direction from where it was. Yeah, not everybody can go out and buy a hundred acres in, in Illinois. Five years ago. And then there's, you know, guys like Bobby who were making $200 a night playing in bars. Uh, changed know, his mindset. Country music. Changed his mindset and said, I need to invest in a piece of land. Started small mm-hmm. and grew it to the business that they own there. And that's entrepreneurship. Whether that's it's, capitalism. Whether it's for better or worse, you know, I can understand both, both sides of it, but uh, in the future, there may be people that have access to hunt and people that, that don't. I, I really do. Th- and we'll t- I'm sure Matt will get into that at some point, but I really do think that there will be a point. Um, there will always be public land, but the, the experience on public land will be dog shit. It, it won't be worth anything to people. Um, not far off. Yeah. And so it, it, there will be, there'll be very different experiences in the hunting public. Uh, there'll be people that have just bad experiences and tough goes at it and, and maybe don't see a deer or can't kill a deer. There'll be other people that have kind of these, you know, properties that are well-managed and, and are very selective of the deer that they're harvesting. 
Um, and then you'll have a group in between permission. People still exist, friends of family that own land, sure. whatever. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. I, I think that's healthy for the dynamic of hunting, uh, that not everybody can just go, if everybody could go out and afford land to manage it, land would be $30,000 an acre right now. That's, that's the truth because the demand, if everybody that hunted could afford land, the demand would drive it to a point where it was, it was a rich man's sport period. Um, where it is today, it is still attainable by most pub people hunting if they want it, if they want to change their mindset and they want it, they can figure it out. It ain't going to be easy. It's going to require a lot of work. It will sacrifice. require a lot of sacrifices. That's, that's where we're at today. If all of a sudden everybody could afford land, then most of us can't Talking afford land. Talking about real sacrifices too. I mean, dude, both you and I have had conversations with our wives in the past couple of days. It's like, <laughs> it's not just me sacrificing. It's, are you willing to sacrifice? Yeah. Our family. Are we willing to make the sacrifice together? Like this commitment to, to this investment, this thing that we'll enjoy. And it's, it's there's a, a lot of trust decision. in the relationships to do that too. Yeah. Cause it's a substantial amount of money when you invest in a farm. Um, it, in it, it's not like, okay, let's just go buy it and do it. The work continues outside of that farm to pay for that farm. Mm -hmm. the, the sacrifices continue to afford that farm. And there are people that won't do it. They're, they don't, they don't want it. No problem with that. But you can't criticize somebody who's willing to do it and to sacrifice. Yeah. Um, look, at, look at your motivations, you know. If, I mean, dude, if I, if I wasn't, you know, when it boiled down to it, willing to do anything to kill giant deer, mm -hmm. yeah, at least at this point in my life, I mean, that's, that's the pursuit here that's driving mm -hmm. us to land ownership, yep. but along with the other added, added benefits and stuff. It's, but what, what drives you enough to be able to make a sacrifice like mm -hmm. that? Yeah. It's an interesting thing. I mean, the, the, the property that got <laughs> me started was a cabin in some acreage. Of course it had hunting in it. Like it, that was a big piece of it. I had place to hunt, but was it, it, to Bomar's point was not, not in big buck territory. It was a new mm -hmm. state. Um, but that cabin in that 75 acres I bought right before the kind of land boom happened. Um, that's what was my first investment. And I pulled money out of a Roth R RIA that was like, you know, it was already taxed. They're like, what am I, it was contributions. What am I doing with it? Like I'd re I can't do anything. Why would I not use that to buy a cabin and property that my family can enjoy every other weekend if we wanted to? That's what we did. And that was the, that was the first property that was 2019. So it was four years ago that starting this train now to having two properties in Kentucky, a property in Ohio, and soon to be likely a property in Illinois, all of that coming from, you know, the mindset of like, oh, this is great. And it's tangible. And we've had some of the best memories of our family on that property. We've had great hunts on that property. Uh, I'd love to do that again. Can I? Yes. What do I need to sacrifice to do that? Okay get to the point where you do it and there's nothing better i mean because it is it, i know but it's scary <clears throat> i mean see, i i loved your roller skating <laughs> rink because that's what it is it's it's a yeah. i mean it's a roundabout when are you going to jump when, what if you have somebody and it, it's not me patting myself on the, if you have somebody like me and you where i've i'm in the rink mm -hmm. i'm doing it i've done it i've been able to fund these things for multiple years i've had some successful investments the ohio farm is the ticket the fact that I'm making a, a large chunk of tax-free money on that timber uh, is allowing me to do an Illinois type of thing. Mm -hmm. When you can rely on somebody who said, hey, just come with me. I've done this before. It will be scary. But it's easy to say. This piece of paper, we're not going to show you exactly what's on it. But this piece of paper is me breaking it down to you to say, Jared, I've got confidence in you and I being able to do it. Here's the numbers. Here's how we can do this yeah. thing. It, it's one thing. And I'm the perfect example to say, we're going to do it. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do this. And, but when it literally comes time to like sign your name on the piece of paper to make, make the offer mm -hmm. or the commitment and realize, say, I'm literally going to pull money out of these different areas. This is what this is going to mean. Not only for right now, what that looks like, but for future mm -hmm. other opportunities. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's when it gets real. Yeah. And I think, uh, it, there will always be an element of that. I mean, even if we do this together, like that next, uh, there will be butterflies of me doing that, but because I've done it and been able to keep doing it successfully. Um, and it's, I'm not saying like I'm making banks of money on it at any, like I'm struggling and sacrificing to make those payments, but I know where the future of that is. I mean, the appreciation on that first farm I bought, uh, 
four years ago, less than four years ago, has already gone up um, almost fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, uh, and I've I haven't done anything to it. Yep. That, well, that's that that equity piece of it. I mean, that's that's where wealth from assets and specifically real estate comes from, and so it, it grows over time. And it's also something that you can acquire immediately if you want to buy something for under market value or two. See these the elements, unrealized of, potential. These unrealized potential. You know, and that's huge, man. That, that's like how you get good at making money in real estate. I'm I am perfectly fine buying something at market if I know that the unrealized potential in the next year that can happen from it, whether it's property line disputes that hey, that's actually a lot bigger than they think it is, or timber value or government programs, government programs, recreational progress. recreational value of progress. All of those things in a year time period can take me from basically having a little bit of equity when I bought it to having enough equity that I could lean that thing against the next property immediately. Or sell it for a gain. There you go. Yep. And that's it. And and again, don't over overdo it, but get in the game. Get in the game. Get in the game. So anyways, we appreciate Bobby from the Whitetail Group coming on. Uh, cool conversation. We'll absolutely have him back on. Probably I'll text him. We need to get Lee Lukoski on uh, and have a discussion on some stuff because obviously Lee's kind of in that same mindset. And uh, yeah, man, just just continuing. You know, we hope these I bought a farm pieces are just we're learning at the same time, right? The CRP questions I know you had there about both. I was almost ready to like get a pen and start writing stuff down. Yeah. Um, but it's because all of this information is just such a huge wealth when the time is right to buy your property. Um, you know, we want to bring a source of all this information to the table. So it's like, ah, what did they say about CRP? Can I take that out? Uh, put- I've done it. I've gone back and listened to our podcast. I'm like, what, what did this guy say? What's, what was the common lands thing? Oh yeah. I went back yeah. and yep. case in point. Um, I, I, we did some research on this. One of the properties we're looking at has some CRP in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, 10% of the field can be turned into a wildlife food plot. Mm-hmm. So if it's a 10 acre field, we can create one acre of wildlife food plot and stay within our CRP that's huge. Yeah. Huge knowledge. And, and at a local level, I mean, it comes down, I think, to working with your NRCS yeah. office. Just make the relationship, go meet them. And, uh, yeah. you know, you can have mouth of the farm, you know, walk programs. with them, you know, show them that you care. To Bobby's point, if you go to these guys and say, man, I, I just want to make, I'm not sure. Like, maybe it's done right. But do I need a burn? Dude, Whatever. We, we really can be their best friends. The first time I ever met Jed Colbell, I it was through the NRCS office. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I really, I've heard about this hinge cut thing. I'm really trying to improve. It turns out he lives five minutes down the road. That's and so he'd come cool. out and just marked all my timber for free. And he's like, I appreciate that you want to do this. And then, you know, now now we've got this relationship. Yeah, timber and relationship. I've, through him, I've met all these other people at the farm office. And so it, it really pays to uh, get connected with your local uh, government as it relates to those programs. Crazy, man. Uh, well, we appreciate you guys listening to this episode of I Bought a Farm. Not sure what episode, but it's Bobby Kendall. It's an episode. <laughs> it's an episode. And uh, we've got some more coming down the pipeline here over the over the next few weeks. So uh, keep tuning in. Later. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the I Bought a Farm podcast, make sure you check it out every other Thursday night on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and any other place that you might find your favorite podcast.